Hello and welcome everybody to the third and final networking conference organized by Connect for Creativity. We've got a really exciting program of events for you today and um, Connect for Creativity, if you haven't had a look at their website, will definitely put you in the mood. Uh, they've got lots of links on there um, uh, for you to have a look at. And it's an 18 month project led by the British Council in collaboration with Tola and Abdul uh, Gul University in Turkey. Um, BIOS in Greece and Nova Iskra in Serbia. We've got fantastic people lined up for you, not to mention our keynote speaker, Robert Henker, who is waiting in the wings. Um, so do introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, if you're here waiting with us just whilst a few more people join us, we'd like to know uh, where, which city you are in. We want to know uh, who you are and what you do very briefly. And I'd be interested to uh, see you just tap into the chat pieces of work that have inspired you. That's what I'd like you to share today as a little starter question. Pieces of work, digital work artists that are making stuff that you think is really something that everybody needs to be watching and having a look at or links that people can click on and have a look at interesting work that's being made at the moment whether that's music installation pieces design work stick it in the chat so that everybody can benefit from that we've got about 300 people from 26 countries in 66 cities connecting to this conference so that's pretty exciting so we're interested in your conversations. Uh, you're gonna be the ones asking questions. If you have a question at any point, please put it in capital letters in the chat so we can discern it from everything else in the Zoom meeting. Um, let us know what's resonating with you. Let us know what you're thinking about, um, what isn't resonating, um, things you're really passionate about and, and questions of course that you've got for our speakers as we go. We'll try and take as many of those as we can at different points in the morning. So we're just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Obviously we're in a Zoom room, um, speaker buttons, gallery buttons at the top right. You can click on those um, to change your view at any time. It's going out live on YouTube. So um, you can watch it, catch up at other times. Please feel free to keep your camera on or off. Um, get up, stretch, get a glass of water, cup of coffee, um, be comfortable. And um, if you haven't registered for one of the workshops this afternoon, uh, there is still space. It's on a, a first come first serve basis. So you just need to let the team know which workshop you'd like to attend. And I think you probably do that in the chat. Um, if you don't, then there'll be a link up. I'm sure the admin team um, will be putting a, a link up in the chat um, showing you how that you can register for the workshops. So it's time for me to introduce Robert Henker, composer, artist and software designer extraordinaire, pioneering uh, surround sound and wave field synthesis, renowned for his legendary work, his installation pieces, electronic music, combining sound algorithms and laser technology, not to mention his contribution to the industry as one of the main creators of Ableton Live. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is going to be pretty informal because, I mean, the topic is how digital is changing the way we relate to each other. And the topic of my talk is how technical process shape artistic results. And I had major technical problems uh, the last two days setting up an installation in Hannover. And that kept me from actually doing my preparation work for this um, talk, uh, which therefore will be very informal. Uh, which on the other side kind of nicely fits the current situation. And the fact that we talk about technology and that we cannot meet in person at a festival, but are relying on technology to communicate. And that we got so used to the fact that we are communicating now via Zoom rooms and stuff like this already changed so much of our social habits in so many ways. That is really interesting to see this in the uh, context of technology in general that suddenly something that is very non-technological, very biological, has such an impact on how we use technology. And also it shows how fragile everything is we uh, take for granted. And um, so we're living in interesting times for philosophers thinking about technology. Uh, the topic of my talk was uh, how a technical process shapes artistic outcome. And uh, 
I'd like to start with uh, a little bit of history talking about Monolake, the, the project, which was the first thing I and Gerhard Beles, who later became the CEO of Ableton, uh, did together that was kind of relevant artistically for myself. And um, so the point with Monolake was that um, it was a duo, obviously, it was Gerhard and me, and we were jamming in the studio and we were jamming as uh, our way of expression with technical tools uh, because we had no intent to release anything in the first place. Uh, it was pre-internet. It was pre-SoundCloud um, and pre-Bandcamp. So the idea that everything you do leads to a finished product uh, was not really the, the topic. The topic was more using technology to explore things that are interesting for both of us and having fun. And the, the way this was technically set up was pretty much a studio based around a few synthesizers and uh, drum computers and sequencers. And it was working as a collaborative effort with a kind of a very clear separation of work. So Gerhard did mainly the sequencing, sitting on the computer and typing in numbers. And I was doing the mixing and the sound design and the effects. And um, <clears throat> so in order to turn this momentary expression uh, and joy into something that could be conserved later, we had to have some means of recording. And the medium of choice at this time was called digital audio tape. That is something no one knows anymore. This is this little small cassettes. And so what you did is you just hit record on the data recorder and recorded a one hour jam. And afterwards, the only way to make sense out of this in terms of making a piece of music out of it was taking this stereo recording and editing it. And at this time, editing on a computer was still uh, expensive. And we had access to the electronic studio of the Technical University, where we at night secretly did this. And the, the resulting composition was pretty much a result of this technical process of improvising very long for hours, recording it and edit, editing it down. So the technology had a clear impact on the result. And it is also interesting to note uh, which absence of technology also had an impact. It just happened uh, that we neither had an 808 or 909 drum machine or any of the iconic Roland drum computers at this time, uh, which meant that our music was lacking those sounds which meant the music was different. Um, and it was not intentionally different. It was just different because of the tools we used. And <clears throat> since we never anticipated that we would make anything that would be related to a techno context, we never saw us in this, um, we didn't bother. And it was other people who contextualized what we were doing in this framework of basic channel and the hardwax people and everyone else who just happened to be our friends. So. The, the studio collaboration was a um, basically real-time jam that had to be edited down to non-real-time to a finished product later. And this is something which I find very important when we think about uh, the process of music making as a technological process. Before the invention of recordings, uh, music was basically real-time. And there was no difference between um, performing music um, and experiencing music. The only way to experiencing music was a performance. And suddenly recording got invented and everything got much more complicated because nowadays we have a situation where most electronic music is created in a non real time fashion. I would say probably 99%. And that means if something like this has to be brought on stage, you have to do something different. You cannot just perform the same thing that you do in a studio on stage. And this was an interesting experience that uh, shaped also the, <clears throat> the way Gerhard and me were thinking about music, uh, because at some point there was a demand. So friends asked if we want to perform our music um, in their um, backyard uh, or basement club or whatever was available in Berlin at this time. So we just brought the studio 
basically into the club, uh, which means a lot of that stuff just went into a, a car and got set up in a <clears throat> club. But what we could not do, of course, in real time was all the editing, which basically shaped the pieces into the final pieces. And that meant that what you could experience in such a live situation was this endless jam. And this was pretty much the, the type of music that came out of it. Um, sometimes we had good luck and this jam was, let's say, to 30%, 40% good. So people who experienced one hour of monoleg life could experience maybe 20 minutes where actually something meaningful happened. Uh, there were other moments where the outcome of uh, what we did was much less. And of course, this uh, was a unsatisfying situation. Um, but the technology we had on hand at this time <clears throat> pretty much made nothing else possible. And at some point in this history, around 1997 or 80, 1998, Gerhard decided that um, after finishing his university, that founding his own company would be his main interest. And <clears throat> I joined this company, uh, more about that later, but suddenly I was alone. And being alone meant that everything we set up technologically to work as a kind of jam duo situation didn't make sense anymore. Jamming with myself in the studio felt extremely pointless. So I had to adapt the technology to make sense of the new situation. And I started building a sequencer that was much more powerful, more complex in order to be able to actually perform by myself something with more complexity. And at this time, Apple started to release the first uh, so-called power books, which were the first laptops which were powerful enough to actually do audio processing on a laptop. And suddenly everything was very different. Technology enabled me that I could travel with just a laptop and um, perform as monoleg with a sequencer and a few samplers in one laptop. And that pretty much saved me or saved the monoleg project. But it also had an effect on the other thing. And this is the thing I'm gonna talk about now. This thing here, I need to see my own picture to see if I'm, where's me on the screen here. So um, Ableton Live, uh, the sequencing instrument as it has been called at the beginning. Uh, the idea to develop a piece of software for live performance came to us pretty natural, uh, simply because that's the only thing we had experience with. And this was also something that was not existing before. And when we think about how a tool is shaping the result and how the technology is shaping the result, um, <clears throat> Ableton Live, of course, had a huge impact on how people make music. But there's one thing I was always uh, considering, and this is the fact that if Ableton would not have come up with this kind of idea, like the session view and this idea of real-time performance, uh, someone else would have, because it was an emergent idea. It was an idea that technology was providing and that at some point someone would have done. The interesting uh, thing, if you think about how how much software or how much technology changes what we do is the fact that for very practical reasons, life was very limited at the beginning. Um, we decided when we started to work on life that it only works with audio, uh, simply because having synthesis running on the computer in a um, massive way would have been impossible back, back in these days. So life became this thing that worked with sound files and it worked with quantization and it worked with the speed grid and with all these kind of limitations that we had to put in place in order to make it happen. And as a result, the, the way people make music did pretty much change from this endless flow to a very block kind of thinking of global quantization of one bar loops of two bar loops. Um, so the benefit of having it all in the computer and the benefit of being able to use a lot of material came with a price. And the price was that uh, 
instead of having all these instruments where at every instant of time I can turn a knob and change things intuitively, I am limited to a computer screen and to a mouse and to potentially a MIDI controller. And in one way, this is liberating because yeah, people can travel and can perform their music anywhere with, a little, with much less effort. But at the same time, this new technology um, came with its own limitations. Um, how do you deal with that? <clears throat> well, the usual thing that people did was they added MIDI controllers to make sure that there's still some tactile control. Because uh, we are doing this virtual conference here now, and we're sitting in front of our Zoom um, screens. And as much, much as we got used to it, uh, the situation would be different if I would be now in a room with all of you listening here and we could interact. And the same is true for how we interact with software and if we interact with old machines, for instance. Um, so what people did is they were using MIDI controllers to control life. And <clears throat> at some point, I decided that I need a bit more of this freedom back that I had back in the days when we had all these machines on stage. So I built one MIDI controller for myself um, as someone with an engineering background. And this MIDI controller changed very much the way I was thinking about performance. And I'm gonna bring it. So some of you who are a bit older might have seen this in real on stage with me. Um, this thing was my attempt to use technology to get something back of a tactile feel to software. And as a matter of fact, it worked pretty well. The, the reason why I stopped using it was very pragmatic. It is heavy and it's the only one of its kind existing in the world and it became too dangerous to travel with it. However, <clears throat> this thing here made it clear that a tactile access to music software is extremely essential uh, for performance. So long story short, a later thing that came out of this idea is this one here, which actually was very successful because this piece of hardware changed the perception of what the tool can do for so many people that we got a lot of users who would never work with software, but they are totally fine working with software if they have hardware access to it. Because at the end of the day, everything is software in one way or the other. And what counts is the access to it. So access is the big topic. And um, now I need to see what I have here. Um, yes. An important thing to, I'd like to mention when it comes to this piece of technology. Um, when you build technology, you have a certain idea in mind what this technology should do and how people are gonna use it. Um, but people have different ideas and people are abusing technology. And this is always part of a creative process. Uh, with the invention of the grand piano, the prepared piano was invented too. Um, it was just not the perspective of the first people who built it. Um, and with the invention of nonlinear editing, glitch music and micro editing was invented too. <clears throat> it was not the thinking of the people who built this software, but it became obvious for artists that there's something to gain. And my learning experience with using my gigantic MIDI controller was, uh, it was never intended to be a replacement for looking at the computer screen. My idea was always that I use the MIDI controller as a replacement for the mouse and still look at the screen to get an idea where I am in my set. But after performing for two or three times with it, I noticed that I don't need to look at the screen and that I have enough of a, a kind of a vague memory of where everything is located to be able to perform without looking at the screen. At the same time, um, this of course always leads to some mistakes because sometimes you remember things wrong. And as a result, I got in this incredibly interesting new dialogue with my own tool where mistakes forced me on stage to react. 
And uh, I became really uh, hooked to this method of performing where <clears throat> I press a button and I launch a clip without seeing a clip name and without knowing if this is the right one and only have a structure in place that mildly works uh, as a guideline and dealing with the fact that everything is happening instantaneously. And this is something that I find very remarkable that uh, perfection in itself uh, or perfect planning is very often in the way of a creative process. And the tools people use um, when they try to explore creative things very often are tools that allow to make mistakes, that allow to um, push things beyond a certain limit and experiencing something that a developer might say is, a, is an artifact, is a mistake. Um, but the artist says, yes, but I like it. And um, <clears throat> so let me see what else do we have. I have this here. Um, I have this. Um, I like to talk a bit more about um, the relationship between being possible to do everything on one side and limitations on the other side. I mean, that's a topic I've been talking about in a lot of talks, but I find it very important. So I, I come from a generation of people where having access to tools was limited and the ability to have more than one synthesizer was a luxury. And now we have a situation where everyone can use pretty much every technology uh, in their laptops and almost for free. And what I learned from myself and where I was moving back and forth all the time was from working within the laptop, having access to a gigantic library of tools versus working with some hardware, um, which is limited. And I made several attempts to get rid of all that because from a theoretical perspective, I can do everything just in my laptop. There is no technical logical reason why I couldn't. And in fact, 90% of my music or 95% of my music finally gets its shape within the laptop. So I don't need all that, but why do I still have it? And the reason why I still have it is that sometimes it helps me focusing if I'm forced to work with something that is limited. Um, these technical limitations um, make it necessary that I go deep into something. So that I try to find beauty within something that I know very well and where I try to get the most out of things that are very known. Uh, this is a very opposite approach to trying out something new every day. Uh, but I feel that um, this promise of technology that everything is possible is something that artistically um, is not necessarily the best thing to do because it's highly confusing. And the more I dive into what I'm doing, the more I'm happy with superimposed limitations. And I believe the, the challenge these days is that within all these possible scenarios, we can do video, we can do immersive environments, we can do artificial intelligence, we can do neural networks, we can do all sorts of audio processing. Everyone can do everything. There's millions of tools. And how do you find your own creative um, idea within that? And well, my personal answer is limitations. And this brings me in the last um, remaining minutes to something that <clears throat> I'm exploring more and more. When I started to work on uh, visual things, uh, I started working on visual things mainly because I felt the need to uh, get rid of some random VJ who is uh, projecting stuff when I play live instead of playing my own visuals. Um, and at some point I noticed that there's people doing video that are far more advanced than I could ever be. And this is a, a skill I don't have. So instead of, I thought I take a new media which has not been explored that much, lasers and work with them. And the great liberty of working with lasers is that they are so limited. Uh, working with lasers implies there's one beam of light and there's mirrors that move this light very fast. 
And this is mechanical. And you cannot do incredibly complex shapes. You cannot do incredibly complex things moving. You can only do simple things. And within the simplicity, suddenly very, very general musical elements like timing, rhythm, um, succession, overall shape becomes important again. And instead of feeling trapped with the simplicity of the medium, I felt a great sense of liberation because suddenly I was back to asking myself questions about what is it I really want to do? And how can I express this within a very limited set of options? And I believe without my occupation with this very limited medium, uh, I would make different music these days. So there's again a feedback loop between being forced to work with something that's very limited and getting out ideas out of that, that help me navigating through the abundance I have with other media. Um, so in this regard, there's a constant dialogue between uh, limited instruments, limited tools and uh, an abundance. And by experiencing the limitations of one tool and trying to master a limited tool, you get a idea how to deal with, well, abundance on the other side, because there's a, a good chance that you get an understanding of what is it you want to express in the first place and what is personal on your expression. Because that's at the end of the day, what counts in artistic expression is personality. Uh, everything else uh, comes down to basically creating a demo reel for a tool. And this is why um, <clears throat> there is still a chance to do something creative with very old tools, um, because as soon as you inject your own personality into it, uh, it becomes yours. And it doesn't matter if the tool is 2000 years old or 40 years old or from last year. Um, a, a new tool or a new technology in itself um, is not an artistic expression. It's just something that you can use by yourself to become an artistic expression. But the, the art is in the selection and the usage of the tool, which is of course um, very clear. There is one thing I found interesting when we think about how to use tools for creativity. Uh, we seem to all being very focused on creating results because uh, our society is very result oriented. The idea is uh, you have to release things. Um, I mean, Spotify CEO just made himself uh, a complete fool by telling artists that they have to release more music in order to earn more money. Uh, as if the fact of just producing more, like in a factory, uh, is what is the point of artistic creation. And I believe when we talk about technology and about the difficulties to understand technology and master it and work with it, potentially a way of more process oriented thinking uh, is also interesting to say, it's not really important what the result is at the end, because when I'm trying to learn a new tool, when I try to ex express myself within something I found new, and perhaps the, the real value is not that at the end, I put something on SoundCloud or Bandcamp, but the real value is the process. The real value is actually enjoying to learn. And this is something that sometimes seems to get lost um, in uh, a very result oriented uh, society. Back in the days when Gerhard and me were making music together, the idea of releasing music was not our motivation. The idea was having fun. And uh, over the years, this got more and more replaced by this idea of, I have to release a record. And now I'm back to a state mentally where I say, well, I can have actually fun in here. And if I, after playing for a while, feel it was not good, then I can just stop it without feeling guilty for not using the technology to create something that stands for uh, eternity. And so this leads me to one last thought because I see we are already running out of time. Uh, obviously a, a big part of what I'm doing is creating instruments. So I create instruments for myself. 
I create the tools for my laser shows and I write software for ancient computers to get uh, them doing sound design and video. And I develop instruments for Ableton Live. And I figured out that for me, the, the process of creating an instrument is as satisfying um, as actually playing it uh, because it's an artistic endeavor. And I have a very strong relationship to my old instruments here because every single of these instruments have been created by human beings. And these human beings were passion, passionate about what they're doing. So Roger Lynn was passionate, was passionate about building the Lynn drum. Uh, Colin Fraser is passionate about building his crazy complex, uh, inspiring, hard to learn uh, hardware sequencer. And so all these things here are actually results of people being creative with technology. And I use their creativity to become creative by myself. And this is very beautiful because I'm in a dialogue with whatever these people here came up with. And if I like what these people did, then I get nice results out of it. So it's a collaborative effort. We're using technology in a collaborative effort. We create technology in a, a collaborative effort. And there is a lot of artistic thinking involved in the creation of technology. And um, there are some capital questions here. Let's see. You said that human versus machine is actually human versus human. Mm -hmm. uh, the AI question, yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, Robert, can you just read, show it just for those who, who are not necessarily looking at the chat, the question yeah, is. Sorry. Um, um, so uh, Relia uh, asked, you state that human versus machine is actually human versus human as we made the machines in the first place. Would you say that this also applies to implications of AI? Should we look at AI as something that is part of us or external separate um, as humans also created AI? AI is a tricky one, I believe, um, because <clears throat> we create something where we understand the technical process, but ultimately what happens inside the neural network uh, is a black box. And that's the big discussion. Um, for those people who are not really, were listening here and are not really um, deep into this field, uh, there is something where we throw in data to train this thing. And um, afterwards, <clears throat> this thing allows us to create results from new data we feed in. So um, we can train this to recognize this as a coffee mug. And if we do this with 5 million coffee mugs, um, there's a chance that if we present this machine with a photo, uh, some number com comes out of it that says, okay, this is 95% likely something containing coffee. But since we don't know exactly how this result happened, um, we, for instance, don't know which biases this has. Uh, and this thing can't talk to us. If, if a human being makes a decision, uh, be it an artistic decision, a political decision, whatever, we can always ask, why do you think this is not a coffee um, pot? And then this person can tell you something. The AI can't, so we can't question the AI, which means uh, indeed we are reaching a, a gray area here where we build something that we cannot understand anymore. And this is uh, systemic, this is it built in. Uh, it's the whole point of that we don't understand it. That's why it works. Uh, it works because it works on a level that goes beyond what we do uh, and on a different level. And I don't know what implications this has for the arts, uh, but I, I'm 100% certain it has implications on many other fields. And we need to be very careful to uh, see what happens. Uh, but I'm really bad at predicting the future, unfortunately. So. Um, Thanks, I'm... Robert. 
it's it's so interesting hearing you speak and um we literally i think we should just touch on this second question in the chat just before we end because we oh, yeah. are pr almost How out of time so okay. i'll just read it out because for the people on youtube who might be watching yes um won't won't hear so it's about musicality so it's asked oh, yes. how do you decide um how do you include musicality within person and a person expression via a laptop only how do you decide whether or not um, right base it on musicality or technical lo novelty or work the work that you're making okay so there's are many questions the first question is how important musicality is for uh, making electronic music uh if I define musicality as an artistic sense for how things have to be, um, then I would say it's very important, but uh, it is not important to be a trained musician. I think that's the difference. Uh, it's important to make judgments. So if you hit two or three notes on a keyboard and you say, I like this sequence, then no one else can, can argue about that because there is no objectivity. And if I can say these two objects here in space need to be uh, like this forever in my atelier or studio because it's great the way it is, it's a beautiful sculpture. Uh, then other people can say, well, it's in the way if you try to mix, but you can't argue against me saying, this is a sculpture here in my studio. There's no rational way to argue that. And <clears throat> so the most important uh, property for an artist is to be decisive, to say, this is what I want to do, and this is great. Um, so how do you include the personal expression via laptop only? Well, um, I think if you look at this example, if I type um, three sentences on a piece of paper, I mean, this here is my lousy preparation for this talk. Uh, it's a few letters on paper, it's done with a laptop. But of course, it's my personal expression. It could be an invoice, uh, it could be a love letter. So um, I don't think the laptop is the issue. The, 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 the laptop is the issue when it comes to a haptic interaction with a real-time medium. Uh, I can talk here and I can use my voice and I can modulate it and I can express joy, anger, sadness, all these kind of things. Uh, it's much more difficult to express the same thing if I'm just typing on a laptop. But when I talk to you here via Zoom and on Skype, uh, on uh, YouTube later, uh, you will notice a personality here. And you will notice a personality much easier than if I would just type in the same thing. So um, we are about out of time. OK, well, I guess um, that's time now to go to the bar at the festival. I don't know if there's a bar here at Zoom. <laughs> oh thanks Robert so much you've given us so much to think about and um I I just love I love your I love the reassure how reassuring it is to hear you saying to artists be decisive work out what's personal to you and embrace limitation um really really strong strong things to think about and and fascinating to hear you talk thank you so much for your time today Robert will you it stay was lovely us? uh which um which part will be on YouTube later you, 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 you edit out. We the... will work, it, it will all be magically worked out by the creative team in Athens. So we'll leave that to them. But thank you very much. Do stay with us. Um, then if people have got things they want to ask you on the chat, they can. Uh, they uh, can I, can, I can certainly do this uh, on the chat great. window. Here. Thank you, Robert, so much. Thank you. It was a, a great pleasure. Um, and um, I hope it was not too improvised. It was perfect. It was perfect. So perfect. We, we now, we're now going to move on to um, a panel discussion and Katerina Gujuli is going to uh, moderate this. Um, the panel discussion is entitled Artistic Creation and Technology. Who is using who? Katerina, would you like to take over? Thank you, Hannah. Hello, everybody, and welcome again. Thank you for joining us for this session, which is part of the Creative Explorations Conference Day 2. I'm Katerina, I will be facilitating this panel, and as Hannah mentioned, the title is Artistic Creation and Technology, Who is Using Who? We are delighted to have four great speakers with us today, namely Kan Buyuk Perber, Ilan Manoir, Dimitris Haritos, and Pocayo, who will talk about their artistic practice and professional practice, exploring different perspectives of art and technology in the digital age. So before we start, I would like to remind you that you can use the chat box to post your questions. 
please do so by stating your name and your question in capital letters. And we will have a short Q&A uh, session at the end of our presentations. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Khan Buyuk Berber. Khan is a visual artist and director from Turkey. He creates immersive audiovisual experiences that are embodied in physical and digital spaces. His practice consists of experiments with various media such as virtual and augmented reality, projection mapping, geo geodesic domes, large-scale displays, and digital fabrication. So Khan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so I think I can share my screen. Um, let's see. Okay, can, can you see my screen now? Yep. Perfect. All right. So uh, thank you so much for your invitation. I'm very excited and uh, honored to be a part of this conference with all these great minds. It was great to uh, listen to Robert Tanke. I'm a big fan of him. Uh, and I want to thank you to all of our viewers from all around the world joining us today, probably uh, from their homes. So uh, this is, here is normally a one hour keynote, but uh, I will try to give you an overview of, you know, my work and interests in the next 10 minutes and how I use, uh, and how the use of technology uh, helped the evolution of my uh, creative expression. Uh, I'm not going to talk about these projects one by one, but uh, you can go uh, read and watch about them, uh, everything you see here on my website. So uh, I, I prepared this automatic slideshow for the next 100 uh, slides. So hopefully it's going to help and I'm going to talk over it. So uh, for the last 10 years, uh, I've, been, I've been working with um, immersive media and um, as a visual artist. And my aim was to uh, using these immersive audiovisual works push the boundaries of uh, traditional narratives of art, cinema, and music. So uh, these projects sometimes took place as a large-scale projection installation in public, uh, sometimes within geodesic domes or a virtual reality headset or as a 3D printed sculpture. So uh, I, I really heavily focus on the relationship between the physical and digital media and the, one of the great things in our ages uh, a work, a, a digital content can be displayed in so many different ways. So uh, we can really customize it for different environments, for you know, festivals, museums, galleries, or people can experience the same giant installations in their homes with their uh, virtual reality headsets. And one of the other great things is uh, we are all now, you know, people from different fields are using their computers as their studios and software as their tools. So that allows us to have a wider range of uh, collaborations. So uh, me personally, I've been involved in many different, you know, interdisciplinary collaborations with scientists, architects, uh, musicians, wellness teachers. Um, so I'm always looking forward to expand my, you know, interface with my reality through these kind of uh, interdisciplinary dialogues. And I've experienced with some of these works you see here, uh, how new media can be really powerful uh, to raise public awareness on the vital matters of our time. Um, so um, in general, you know, the way I see the world is, uh, you know, our daily lives are surrounded by digital technologies exponentially, especially in the moment now, it's even more relevant. Uh, and we are moving toward living more and more in these digital worlds. And uh, like this conference, our jobs, our emotions, our friendships, uh, our art, everything is more and more uh, happening, performed in these digital environment. So uh, it, in some cases, this is a cool uh, extension of um, you know, our lives, but sometimes it's just out of necessity and not, we're not really choosing this voluntarily, but we don't have any other option to uh, you know, communicate at the moment. So these digital displays we use and look at every day, they are becoming larger and larger and they're surrounding us more and more with more 
uh, with an endless uh, flow of information. And these are becoming also part of our, you know, public spaces and architecture. We see these giant displays everywhere now in our daily lives, in our homes. Um, and we are looking, we are spending significant amount of time looking at these displays. So it, it is doing something to us. Uh, it is reshaping how our brains are wired. You know, it's shaping our emotions. Um, and it is it, it, soon with you know, with the advancements in these, you know, augmented reality technologies, this digital interfaces are going to be coming, uh, they're going to be overlapped with our normal daily vision. So th this is going to be a whole new, you know, additional layer of world. Um, I, I'm, you know, some, some days I'm waking up to a more concerned state of mind about this. Sometimes I'm more optimistic, but uh, the useful thinking for me is uh, understanding as artists and designers, um, we have a chance to be the architects, the uh, thinkers of this new space. So we can decide how the communications are gonna function in these new digital spaces, how they're gonna look like these digital worlds, what kind of aesthetics, what kind of uh, sounds, colors, you know, all, all these different type of decisions. We, we have uh, a, lot, a, a lot of initiative in this uh, decision-making. Um, so, uh, you know, while having this kind of responsibility to make these kind of decisions in this digital world, I, uh, my work is heavily inspired by nature as I assume, you know, many of us working on this field. And I view the nature as the greatest uh, generative artwork ever emerge through these, you know, software like fundamental forces and principles that we can observe all around the universe and ecosystems. And as we understand our planet deeper, we see these emergent properties everywhere and we can learn something from it. We can apply it to our artistic creations or systems we create uh, in order to benefit from the intelligence out there that is already existing outside of the computers, you know, the not the artificial one. Uh, and uh, these processes are the biggest source of inspiration for me. Uh, like I mentioned, I love mimicking those patterns I observe. And I think I see the role of the artists and the use of emerging technologies. These are vital uh, to make these invisible intelligence uh, visible. So in terms of, uh, I have a, a couple of more minutes, uh, you know, when we think about the main discussion of this conference, how digital ch changing, how we relate to each other and with this panel who is using who, um, I, I see, I view this as a mutual evolutionary process uh, where, you know, we shape our tools, then our shape tools shape us like Marshall McLuhan put it and this heavily affected my lifestyle, like working with these kind of media, working in this field. Uh, the, the more time I spend with my computer, the more uh, time I focus on, you know, different uh, ways of uh, creativity using different media. Uh, I can feel I've been also, th this became a focus for my personal growth as well. Uh, uh, something I discovered with the new media, it gives me more independence or freedom. You know, uh, I, I, I can use less uh, physical objects in order to create new work. So this makes me even more independent in my lifestyle. You know, we can be location independent in this uh, world right now, being artists in this field. And uh, something I see, you know, interesting is, uh, I have people in this field, you know, who are heavily inspired by the future inventions and, you know, we're uh, trying to prophesize or speculate about how the future may look like through the advancement in technology. Uh, we were always speculating, but now we suddenly with this pandemic found ourselves in that future where, like I said, involuntarily, we need to uh, start to communicate and live and do our work in these platforms. Uh, and I think the artists are kind of uh, pioneers slash early adopters of any time a coming future. 
And I think they've been already living this lifestyle and uh, you, you know, using these tools and, and now a bigger you know, mass population is starting to inherit you know, these tools and communication methods. And hopefully they can take uh, away something you know, creative out of it and uh, you know, make their mark on this new uh, digital territory in this world, new world building stage. Thank you, this is my 10 minutes. Thank you, Khan, for your short and precise presentation and your inspiring work. So moving on to our next speakers, we'll have time for questions after the end of all presentations. So the next one is Ilan Manoir. Ilan is a, sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Ilan is a multidisciplinary artist with a specific interest in conceptual and post-digital comics. He currently holds a PhD researcher position at the Aalto University in Helsinki, where he examines the intersections of contemporary comics and 21st century technological disruptions. His artistic work claims for the importance of comics as a materially self-reflexive medium unaffiliated to any general art history. So Ilan, I'm giving you the virtual floor and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Katarina. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yep. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I would like to speak about the Neural Yorker. It's a project that we have been working on since a few months uh, with a small organization I helped founded in London last year. And I'm going to start about speaking about a bit about deep neural networks and how they have they have helped us shape uh, our concept and our practice in order to reinvent a bit the comics medium and the cartoon medium. So deep neural networks uh, have very recently played a very transformative role in advancing AI across uh, various application domains. Some of the most creative bits of contemporary art are happening today at the junctions between different disciplines and technologies. I would like to present you here this experiment that we have been working on which involves the automation of cartoons and comics using deep learning and more specifically generative adversarial networks and language models. The running slideshow that I'm going to initiate now is a non-curated collection of our automated Twitter account uh, that you can follow it on twitter.com neural net slash neural yorker. So, so I'm part of a global community of conceptual comics artists whose goal is to explore comics outside the traditional scope of literary and artistic practices involving text and image. Contrary to many of our colleagues, we feel comfortable experimenting with tools and knowledges coming from post-colonial critique, digital humanities, and network technologies. Our works are located at the crossroads of different media practices and sensibilities and evolve beyond disciplinary formal and compartmental media terminology. My ongoing publishing activity investigates comics as objects particularly amenable to programmatic processes. From my early book, Facsimile Appropriation, to the shape reader system of communication, specifically designed for readers with visual impairment, on the latest experiments based on the orchestrated work of hundreds of comics artists around the globe, each book project can be easily described as a set of instructions. These projects, therefore, in a programmatic fashion similar to the bottom-up algorithmic process of deep learning, express a choice to locate the medium of comics in the widest affect aperture. Similarly, the project I present you today claims for a perpetual becoming of the cartoon medium by furthering estranging the comics object to a machinic, non-human understanding. So I'm here today as a founder of Applied Memetic, an organization that researches the political repercussions of synthetic media and highlights the urgency for a new media rich internet literacy. The organization is committed in synthesizing graphic narratives and the last months we have been working on our ambitious project, The Neural Yorker, trained on a very large collection of cartoons and punchlines. This project comes as a multimodal generative architecture that produces uh, daily cartoons inspired by Twitter's trending hashtags and topics. It is still in its infancy mode and operates in a semi-supervised learning 
but the algorithm is gradually set to fit the contemporary industry standards for press cartoons. We are not there yet. As you can see, uh, the graphics are quite uh, raw, uh, but the algorithm is slowly learning its way into the nitty gritty of the cartoon profession. I consider here important to provide some context for the nature of automation in comics. While speculations about the growing role of machines in artistic production have been a consistent trope in modern contemporary art debates throughout the 20th century, comics from their early beginnings have been symbiotically expanding with the development of printing, distribution, communication, and media technologies. These industrial processes of completion based on the generalized automation, standardization practices, and an orchestrated division of labor are so embedded in the ways we understand and consume comics that have become an essential feature for the conceptualization of artistic practices in our medium. A typical production line of manga, the Japanese comics, involved dozens of people handling specialized roles in a quasi-Taylorist production belt often in ways that have been criticized for resembling a sweatshop. While distribution has been increasingly involving massively digitized operations of logistics and global supply chains. And this is only about mainstream comics. Comics is an industrial form of expression. At the same time, the comics industry has been quite reticent in embracing the complex nature of technological developments in AI. But this situation, I argue, might soon change. The online abundance of digitized media content available through third party groups of comics fans, the increasing convenience of programming language frameworks and machine learning libraries, the secularization of knowledge through e-learning and the plummeting prices in specialized hardware might contribute to reach a critical point where AI will be gradually integrated in the comics pipeline. Synthetic and generative processes might soon reshape the ways we produce, consume, archive, and distribute comics artifacts. A more wide adoption of AI in different strata of the industry might reconfigure existing readerships and markets. It will ultimately force a radical realignment for the practitioner's artistic ethos and contribute to the formation of new reader sensibilities. Applied Memetic, our organization, acknowledges the full matter of factness of the available technological tools, certainly not in terms of a reified glorification based on questions of progress or innovation. At best, a reconfiguration of the industry's entrenched roles of production, which means who is entitled to be an artist who is entitled to be a reader. The project represents a considerable technical and artistic challenge as it explores a set of operations and program routines that do not conventionally account for the production of cartoons, such as web scraping, image classification, computer vision algorithms, active learning, language modeling, indexation, cloud computation, etc. So we are particularly interested in two algorithmic generative architectures the different types of generative adversarial networks and language transformers. Generative adversarial networks known as GANs are one of the most successful image synthesis programming architecture in the past few years. They have the ability to generate novel images by emulating the probability distribution of any given training data set, as Robert explained in his previous uh, talk. The architecture is based on adversarial training by pitting two or more neural networks against each other. The first network is called the generator. It generates samples that are intended to come from the same probability distribution as the training data. The other network is called the discriminator. It examines the samples to determine whether they are real data coming from the data set or negative training examples that are used by the first network, the generator. The two networks compete in what is known as unsupervised learning. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator 
by having it accept the generated data as ground truth. This GAN architecture resembles a zero-sum game where the model converges when both neural networks reach what is known as a, as a Nash equilibrium, which is a state where the actions of each neural network will stop having any effect on its adversaries. It's a very Marxist dialectical uh, situation. The generated samples will then theoretically be indistingu indistinguishable from those that are in the data set. Or our text, as you can see from this, sometimes very strange punch lines, have been developing different language models based on the open source pretend model GPT-2 and the data's different texts, as well as custom-made data set consisting from hundreds of digitized books on humor, uh, cartoons, etc. Uh, I'm going to end with a small statement, uh, which I would like to position this project in the, in the literature. Actually, within this computational creativity literature, uh, most papers and academic researchers have proposed different algorithms in the exploration of the creative potential of a machine. In their attempt to replicate a certain view of the evolution in history of the arts, popular models in computationally creative systems usually agree in constraining the novelty of their output. Most models seek to reach an equilibrium between the hypothetical spectator's optimal level of potential arousal and the supposedly negative hedonic effect of too much novelty. We differ in that regard. This project is an opportunity for us to explore our conventional processes by weakening the aesthetic predispositions and received knowledge that are reproduced to specific human evolutionary interpretations of comics. Instead, we are interested in harnessing the machinic understanding of comics through recurrent patterns, probability distributions, and outliers in comics language that have been lurking in our pre-attentive reader's cognition and that we haven't been able to articulate in words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ilan, for this thought-provoking presentation and your view actually on AI and comics. So moving on to our next speaker, uh, Dimitris Haritos. Dimitris Haritos is an associate professor at the Faculty of Communication and Media Studies and head of the Department of Digital Arts and Cinema at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. He has studied architectural design, computer aided design, and holds a PhD on interactive design and virtual environment design. Since 1996, he has authored and co authored more than 90 publications in books, journals, and conference proceedings. And as a new media artist, he has produced electronic music, audiovisual, and interactive installations and virtual environments since 1983. So, Dimitris, thank you for being with us. And I give you, you the too. virtual floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I share yeah. the screen now. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, I, I'll talk. Um, um, thank you, firstly, for inviting me uh, in this uh, very interesting uh, gathering uh, and uh, collection of uh, uh, presentations. And I'd like to talk about uh, two things mainly, uh, which in some ways relate to the theme of the session. Uh, one is the um, interactive artwork that we are. Uh, we have just finished uh, and we are awaiting for its opening uh, as soon as the coronavirus allows for it. Um, this is a project called Athens. It was actually curated by Katerina, who I thank very much for this. And uh, it, it's actually a uh, interactive installation which um, is getting uh, input from urban data. We have installed a series of uh, um, uh, sensors in, oh, let, let me for just uh, show the team of uh, the people who worked on this project. Uh, the names were at the beginning, and if you uh, check the athsense.gr website, you will find all the details and the credits. And this was uh, conducted in the context of the Polis II Interventions in the City project of the municipality of Athens, funded by this and installed at the Serafio building where you can uh, very soon go and see it and enjoy it. And uh, mainly what we try to do here is uh, 
to um, use urban data, um, uh, which we capture from uh, a series of sensors uh, installed in um, um, uh, two uh, areas of the environment of uh, central Athens. And um, we somehow translate this data uh, to different multi-sensory presentations of content in space, thus creating spatial experiences. Um, I'll very briefly, um, let, let me just do that for a moment. I'll very briefly show you the architecture of uh, the work, um, which shows the, the central server here, uh, the website that feeds off the server. This is the series of uh, input uh, devices and uh, subjective devices being humans. So uh, we don't only use sensors, but we also uh, allow for uh, the citizens to actually give us feedback about how they feel, uh, where they are, when they are somewhere in the city. This is location-based input that is uh, uh, feeding the installation. And uh, uh, we're trying to capture their feeling about uh, the different sensorial aspects of their experience in the city and general what they feel about their here and now. And all this feeds the four parts of the installation, which are very quickly show you here. The first and central part of the installation is um, a visualization of all the data that we capture. And uh, it's uh, presented in a virtual environment built in Unity, uh, which is interactive by video tracking. Uh, and it's projected on a surface. It's not a navigable environment as such. Uh, because we wanted it to be uh, uh, an experience for multiple users. So it's placed in uh, an area in the store of uh, the building. And uh, by using video tracking and iSense cameras, we capture movement of uh, um, uh, the people who are in front of it and they can move about certain elements of the installation. Um, uh, second part is the uh, sound and kinetic artwork. Uh, which is placed next to this um, visual aspect of the piece, uh, where we try to translate the uh, um, environmental measurements, uh, which uh, and also the um, uh, the pollution measurements. We try to translate this into uh, layers of sound, uh, which are projected onto space from six speakers, thus creating a certain spatial experience of of a sound environment, an auditory environment through the placement of the sounds in different uh, uh, places of this store. So it's, a, so it's a six channel, obviously, sound installation. And uh, then there's this uh, kinetic sculptures, uh, which are uh, 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 moving with, uh, uh, through the translation of the um, environmental measurements. And they're generating non-amplified sounds, which are in a dialogue with the um, computer-produced sounds uh, uh, that are projected uh, in the space from the speakers. So here are some structures that we have used. These are all um, uh, ready-made, let's say, <laughs> kinetic sculptures uh, working a bit like that. Uh, yeah. Well, you can kind of hear that, I guess, very well from Zoom. Anyway, um, and the third part of the installation is a series of LED, mat LED matrix displays. These are actually projecting uh, in the space of uh, the Serafio complex, the messages that citizens are inputting in the web app that we have built. And uh, so asking them how they feel at that very moment, wherever they are. And, uh, and these are in a few minutes projected onto um, these LED displays. You can see a little short video of this. And um, then the fourth part of the um, artwork is a, a light installation where, where we, um, try to translate the uh, uh, sound levels, the noise levels that we capture in the city center 
uh, on to, into um, light uh, in a way that uh, as the, uh, the noise increases, then light decreases. So it's like the opposite. And then there's this, this happens here actually. And uh, uh, here in the big, uh, where you see the bigger light, this, this light interacts through the use of a microphone with uh, um, uh, the uh, visitors who are actually located in the installation space. So there's a bench here that you can sit on and actually speak to this and interact with the light in a very simple, minimal uh, manner. Um, now, uh, this all is ready with uh, a few small exceptions and it will be as soon as we can, uh, we will start to publicize it very soon. And if you visit the website of the project, which is afsense.gr, and I'll write it down in the chat later so you can check it, uh, then you can use the web app uh, easily from there and uh, uh, input your own um, feeling about uh, where you are at some point in space and time uh, and uh, feed uh, the installation. Now, if I, do I have two or three minutes or I run out of time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. It's enough, it's enough. Um, last thing I wanted to say, which I think probably relates a bit more to the theme of the discussion is that I have the pleasure and the uh, and the honor to be heading a very new department of the National Cappadocian University of Athens. I know this is all Greek to you, where you see here in this uh, URL, but uh, it will soon be translated. We are very new. Actually, we're entering the second year of our, our functioning uh, as a department. It's a department of digital arts and cinema. I head this department. And uh, what we are trying to do is that we're trying to educate uh, young uh, students uh, into becoming uh, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, uh, artists uh, uh, for using uh, digital audiovisual media, as well as, um, uh, let's say, high-end uh, digital technologies, uh, which I, I guess feed each other. That's why the, the, the title of the department is Digital Arts and Cinema. We understand that uh, cinema uh, and experimental cinema is a part of the roots of uh, new media art and also digital arts uh, in the sense that cinema is today digital mostly. So there's a, there's a constant dialogue there uh, between these two, uh, let's say, areas of art making. And uh, we are um, trying to uh, educate uh, students in a manner that is uh, uh, multidisciplinary and uh, experimental and uh, we hope that very soon we will have uh, interesting results that is uh, very interesting creative people uh, out there making uh, their own uh, creative first steps. Not much I can say in two minutes but uh, I'm uh, available for further discussion later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitris, and we are looking forward to the experience actually as since in Serafio and also congrats for the new department of digital media Thank in you. Greece. Uh, moving on to our last but not least speaker, Pocayo. Uh, Pocayo is an associate professor at the Athens School of Fine Arts, a visual artist, contemporary art curator, strategy consultant for organizations and personal coach for individuals and business executives. He is founding director of the Athens Biennial and has co-founded the Alpha Station for Contemporary Art in Athens. He has exhibited his work internationally and in Greece, and his practice includes painting, performances, theater, and short films. Oka, are you here? Yep. So welcome, the floor is yours. We can't hear you, you have to unmute. It's on the left corner on your screen. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, it's uh, good to have so many friends here in the panel and also in the audience. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you some stuff that I have uh, made. Now, I, um, I have to make a early on um, uh, disclosure. I am a big uh, hater of any kind of um, 
let's say, explanation of art, like uh, that is based on medium. Uh, therefore, uh, I'm a hater of uh, digital art. Although I have a master's in digital art, I don't really uh, understand how can someone still uh, be discussing about digital art. That reminds me, uh, I'm going back to ages, when we were talking about video, uh, when we were talking about web art uh, with such uh, poor examples uh, of art. And this is the same, uh, the same goes for digital art. Basically, uh, poor art has been uh, created uh, by tons daily. Uh, I happen to be a professor in the School of Fine Arts. Uh, in an expanded media, uh, uh, my city is an expanded media. Therefore, I get um, a daily exposure to hundreds uh, or, uh, digital so-called art by either um, artists, um, students, and people that maybe are aspiring to be part of an exhibition that I'm curating, uh, as I am also heading the Athens Biennale. Now, I want to say uh, that I am, though, very much interested in living digital, in what we are doing by living digital, and what does this mean for our identity. Basically, uh, digital is not a tool, so it's, uh, I think uh, we should start uh, abandoning the use of uh, digital as a, as a tool and uh, get, get into understanding digital in a philosophical or I would say existential uh, way. Um, uh, yesterday I was uh, browsing uh, a couple of uh, dozens of applications uh, for uh, AI exhibition um, that we had in uh, Onas Foundation. Um, some colleagues of, of mine were co-curating uh, this project and I came across them uh, with, uh, with, a very, um, with very mixed feelings. Um, by using terminology in order to support uh, and pitch a, a project, I think that uh, does a misservice to arts. Being geeky is not enough uh, anymore. And instead, uh, unless you are applying for a sponsorship by a company or maybe by an, an authority. But uh, regardless of that, within the artistic circles, I think we have uh, retracted from being philosophical to being uh, geeky. And this is a problem that we find uh, in every, I would say, application of art. Now, being uh, in, my, in my talk, I'm good. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the shift from audience to users and uh, from artists to service providers. Now, um, 15 years ago, uh, me and a team of, uh, of colleagues, we started the Athens Biennale. And at that point, um, the exhibition was still, um, was still uh, what a Biennale is. Uh, everyone was talking about a large scale exhibition. And that's what uh, we, uh, naive as we were, uh, thought of creating a, a biennial that was basically a large scale exhibition. Uh, sooner though, we understood that basically we are uh, speaking uh, on our own uh, as curators uh, because the audience was uh, looking after something totally different. Um, therefore, in the, sequence of the next uh, iterations of the Athens Biennale, we moved from the experience to what we felt that was more um, uh, needed uh, at time, what I'm talking about from then 2007 to 2009, to creating uh, what we understood as an experience. Uh, since then, of course, uh, experience has been uh, so trivial, uh, part of the experience, uh, cultural and experience, experience, experiential market, uh, Nevertheless, we understood that if uh, the, uh, the audience is not inside the, uh, the exhibition in a way that makes them feel part of that and not just uh, standing out of that uh, and watching what we are there to propose to them, uh, that made it totally um, uh, unappealing to, to the audience. So we moved for, to build the next uh, biennial as an experience in the set but that was not enough um, on its own end. And uh, what seemed more important is to move from uh, 
experience to engagement. Therefore, the third Athens Biennale was created as, an, as a big engagement, engagement uh, experiment, uh, having the audience interact in many different ways. But that was not even enough. Um, uh, at that point, when uh, Athens was burning, people were out in the streets, uh, also the audience changed. And uh, that's not just a, a social pattern that we are uh, trying to decipher here. There's something more to that. It's the, it's the use of, um, of the digital media and especially the social uh, platforms uh, that they have ultimately uh, totally shifted the, uh, the identity of the audience from someone that is um, passively consuming to someone that wants to be uh, participating. Therefore, Omonia, the 2013 uh, edition of the Biennale, was, uh, had to be redesigned in a way to accommodate this uh, need for participation. And from then on, we moved to co-creation because even that participation was not enough. It didn't have a, uh, it didn't have a, a target and co-creation uh, was uh, uh, in need, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into every uh, single edition. Uh, what I want to, uh, to stretch here is that we are not talking about uh, digital art like it's usually uh, presented uh, like massive digital screensavers. No, it's not like that. We, we, I hate that. Uh, I'm sorry to hear uh, and, list, and see still artists that are engaged in, uh, in, uh, in that kind of art. We're talking about something totally different. For example, we're talking about uh, new, uh, new identities, uh, multiple identities, the possibility to have multiple identities as creators and as uh, audience uh, makes us uh, come to new conclusions. Uh, recently, uh, due to COVID, I think all these things uh, came to, to their uh, first peak, to the first global peak. We understood by creating platforms like uh, the YouTube channels, etc., that we have moved our uh, cultural organizations uh, 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 working into them in a, you know, on a daily basis. We understand that uh, the separation between audience and, uh, and the artist is not valid anymore. We are talking about an audience that, is be that has become users. And the user is not someone that is uh, passively consuming what we, we give them. Uh, the, the user is making uh, their own navigation and their own use of the tools that we are providing. So basically, uh, the user has all the power uh, over our work. And this is a power that we kept to ourselves for uh, centuries. The whole history of art has been based on the, on the singularity of the artist that is so significant and so differentiated that basically uh, is uh, standing on uh, his, her own soapbox, uh, uh, sharing uh, his or her views. We're not talking about our views anymore. Our, our views are becoming more and more obsolete. Who cares about our views? At best, we are becoming moderators. And moderators um, uh, are the, pe the people who can accommodate uh, collective intellect, who can uh, maybe uh, create uh, platforms uh, like the, the Genius platform uh, Ilan has, pro uh, has uh, uh, provided to us uh, minutes ago, that make us see the world in different, uh, in different lenses. Uh, and this is basically the, the most that we can do. Now, uh, I'm of course uh, very troubled to see how, uh, what is the new identity of the artist? The new identity of the artist is uh, that of a service provider. And this is something that as working in the cultural sector, we understand it on our daily uh, interaction with artists. Artists that participate in an exhibition uh, let go of their formal uh, artworks, let go of their uh, former uh, identities, and basically they want to be perceived by cultural institutions as service provider. Therefore, they charge by their participation. And this is a new uh, union, global union uh, that we are um, 
mostly mostly uh, engaged with uh, of unionized uh, artists that we consider ourselves service providers so basically uh, we are giving our time and capacities in an exhibition in a museum or whatever in a buy-in or whatever we are creating something of a service and then that as a professor uh, takes me to my last uh, argument which is uh, i still work working i'm still working on that because basically uh, my laboratory in the school of fine arts uh, is about trying to redefine what uh, the role of the artist in the future should be um, and what uh, i see in um, in awe and amazement is that basically uh, we are talking about that kind of service provider, that the person who is able to provide for others to live a better experience. So we are be becoming something as sophisticated waiters, some uh, like uh, from auteurs to service providers. And this is a, a, a new, uh, I would say, global shift in uh, the perception of our um, occupation. Uh, and then, if this is our occupation, how should we train our new uh, and young artists? We should move from formal training, and, um, and, and I bring this forth as, a, as a, an argument and also as a uh, food for thought, because uh, currently we are working on our core curriculum. I bet uh, Dimitris is also working on his curriculum at, at, uh, at their school. Uh, we should be... Uh, um, in a very uh, brave way, move out from the formal training into emotional training. Uh, how can we best serve others and how can we feel okay about uh, serving others? Is it something that we can do? Is it something that we are uh, uh, trained to do in the School of Fine Arts? No, we are not. We are trained to believe that, that we are the unicorns and this is something that we have to uh, bravely abandon in order to move into a new uh, area, era. Thank you. Thank you, Foka. We have to stop here as our time is limited. Thank you all for your very interesting presentations and arguments, of course. So we don't have much time for questions, but I would like to make one question to all of you and actually give you 30 seconds each to reply, please. So we, we saw various uh, perspectives in, uh, with regards to digital art and technology through your work and ideas. So I would like to ask you, how do you see that digital technologies affect the way you make your projects and how this help us, the users or the audience, redefine our relationship with technology per se? Thank you. Can we start with Khan? Uh, I'm sorry, Katerina. Could you please repeat the question? Of course, of course. So how do you see that digital technologies affect the way you make your art projects mm -hmm. and how these help us, the audience, to redefine our relationship with technology? Yeah, um, I mean, going back to Marshall McLuhan again, you know, it's the classic medium is the message and any kind of media you use affects the way you express yourself. And in terms of uh, you know new media, the software we use, the display methods we use, they all come with their own set of you know rules and limitations, like Robert said. So uh, when I'm presenting something in a VR setting, there is a certain language I'm limited by uh, in order to make an efficient use of that media. But uh, when it is uh, let's say, presented in a physical space, then I need to consider the dimensions of that space and how the spatial experience is going to work. So um, like music, like uh, filmmaking, uh, I, I think digital media and the softwares and tools are definitely coming with their own flavor. Uh, for instance, uh, even, you know, in 3D media, for instance, the artist, like 3D artists, can understand which render has been used because even you know it looks like a standard 3D animation tool. Every different computation has its own look and flavor and warmth, you know. So it's like uh, using different types of uh, paints in a way for a different uh, feeling or a different kind of uh, painting. Thank you. 
So Ilan, do you think that uh, through your art projects, can we redefine our relationship with technology in a way? Uh, yeah, I don't think digital or analog is should be uh, treated as something specific. I think it's a matter of perspective. I'm following Terence McKenna's view on this. So digital is how close you are to media, how far or how affected you are from a media, from, from a medium. Uh, what is special in our project is now the digitality, which again, I think it's a uh, magic glue, all encompassing term, as we hear in electronic music. What is electronic music? I don't understand what it means. Um, Yoros Mazonakis is electronic music. It's electronically produced, mastered, mixed, distributed, etc., and consumed. So I'm thinking that what is special in, in the project is that we're trying to automate and to close the circle uh, in, the, in the automation of comics, because comics were always an automatic and industrial form of expression. And I think that if we manage to bridge the gap of production and consumption, so uh, ideally make comics for machines that are reading comics and responding with comics to each other without any mediation from human, um, from, from human actants, uh, I think I have a lot of things to learn about, about this thing as a comics artist. Super thing. Dimitris and Poka, would you like to share any comments? Yeah. Um, well, it's difficult to answer this very <laughs> quickly, but uh, a couple of things I'll mention which probably relate. Uh, I very much identify with the, what Robert Henke mentioned uh, a while ago. I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, make, for me, making art uh, doesn't have to be is digital or analog media, you know, you, 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 you start to create something and you use whatever you want to use or you need to use or you feel like using, yeah? So, and obviously we're not talking about tools, we're talking about media. Um, and I, I very much also identify with uh, the limitation term. And um, I think that uh, because we have this abundance of uh, new forms of expression uh, through different technologies that can give us this uh, potential, this affordance, and um, the, that um, limiting ourselves is very important because if you don't go deep into the process of using your medium in order to uh, start to structure what you're trying to talk about and what you're trying to say and what you're trying to formulate, then uh, you have no chance of either becoming personal or expressive or whatever. So yeah, uh, it, it is a big problem that we have so many media in our hands. So um, trying to create these limitations and these filters is one of the uh, methodologies that we also try to teach in our school, in our department. Um, um, uh, so I, I uh, and also what's very important is uh, um, what I try to teach my students in both departments that I work with is is the critical use of technology. Yeah, I mean the, I hate the terms innovation and how we um, glorify them or whatever. Yeah, this this should be away from me. I never use them. <laughs> you know, I, particularly when, when we talk about art making, obviously innovativeness is is of no importance yeah so uh, we try to approach uh, this media in a critical manner and uh, try to make use uh, in relation to our expressive uh, uh, practices uh, what we need to make use of yeah to say yeah. something and to, to to formulate the forms that we need to form in relation so, yeah Thank you. Uh, Poka, yeah, I'd like to yes, talk more, uh, but I think I shouldn't. Yeah. Poka, would you like to close the session with a 30 second comment, please? Yeah, uh, I want to uh, respond also to uh, Eva Goria's uh, question about the philosophical uh, versus the geeky. Um, I, what I said is that we should uh, be uh, bravely moving more into the philosophical. Uh, and abandon the geekiness uh, of, the, of the medium uh, discussion, uh, as uh, everyone said before me. Uh, for example, uh, multiple identities. So far, philosophy has been uh, treating identity as something that is uh, expanded, expandable, of course, but also uh, contained. Uh, the digital era now uh, leads us to uh, 
uh, to live into multiple identities. I can be a professor by day, I can be a gender fluid Lolita uh, cruising on the internet by night. And uh, these are the same person. How can I manage, for example, to leave this person, uh, this uh, du uh, dualities uh, or even more uh, personalities at the same time? This is something that neither philosophy has able, uh, has able to, to grasp and of course by sure not art so far. So what are we going to be uh, professing? What are we going to be teaching our students? How are we going to be uh, equipping them for living that kind of life? That they are the, the directors, not of a singular identity, but of, uh, of many identities. Okay, thank you. We don't have any more time, guys. So thank you very much for this interesting session. Uh, the conference actually continues and I'm going to hand over to Hannah. So you can take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you and Katerina for, for uh, uh, facilitating that so beautifully. So we're going to move on now. We don't have time to take a break. So you're going to have to grab a coffee whilst listening. Um, I'm going to pass you over in a minute to our next uh, keynote. Uh, they're a duo, uh, Tejos, uh, made from uh, Serbian uh, Sofia Stankovic and uh, Teodora Stojkovic. Um, originally, as I said, uh, from Serbia, but now living in Amsterdam, they are a pair of design thinkers, designing and analyzing contemporary social phenomena and exploring relationships between humans and technology, working uh, with lots of immersive technology, VR, within fashion, and making projects for clients like MTV and Nike. So, Teyosh, are you there? The floor is yours. Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um... Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sofia and I'm Teodora uh, and we were very much looking forward to coming to Athens back in uh, April but of course as uh, Covid uh, hit we are now here uh, luckily still in, in this form uh, thanks to technology. Um, so we are going to start our presentation. Um, you have to share screen. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not. Sharing now. Do you see our screen? Yeah, we see you very okay. clearly. All right. Great. Uh, so together we, we form Teosh and uh, we are digital designers and our directors, but also we are part of millennials generations, which means that we are rarely caught without a piece of technology in our hands. This is what this photo is all about. Uh, so we often work for clients in the fashion and entertainment industry. Uh, however, we wouldn't be able to actually get noticed by brands if it wasn't for our uh, innovative approach that is uh, almost always related to, to digital technology and uh, social networks. Uh, and uh, we are presenting this through uh, self-initiated projects uh, that we are going to talk about uh, today mostly. Uh, so through these kind of projects, we actually help brands to, to use new mediums and respond creatively to the changes of digital era. So uh, we can easily spot uh, the technological advancement uh, and um, yeah, how, how technology evolved and laugh uh, at the old tech. Uh, but what is harder to spot are the changes within ourselves and the changes uh, in society. And this is one example from China, uh, which is actually quite uh, easy to spot, uh, where they built uh, two separate lanes for people who are on their mobile phones and for people who aren't. Uh, and especially now in the times of COVID. Yeah, actually 2020 came and all of a sudden technology is such a big deal. Uh, I love uh, specifically this photo because it shows how we've gone far with social networks. Uh, so if someone showed this photo 20 years ago, uh, the, context, uh, the context of this photo would be so hard, uh, so hard and also very comical to guess. Uh, first question would be, what is she doing with the ice cream? And then why is she wearing the mask? But this looks almost normal in 2020. So what uh, happened this year is that we witnessed uh, a true digital transformation 
uh, in times of COVID, technology enabled us to continue living lives almost like we used to. So the work continued, uh, also yoga classes uh, were organized online, uh, also meetings. Um, a conference like this one. <laughs> yeah, and more than ever, we are following real time, also the newest measures and restrictions and statistics about COVID via our gadgets. Just a moment. Okay, so uh, maybe the sound is not working, but um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so uh, this is the work we did a couple of years ago for MTV. Um, and uh, we were invited because again, it was on a topic of technology. And what we like to focus uh, in our work is uh, basically how our personal relationship has been built to technology and, and how uh, on, a, on an individual level, it is changing um, uh, the, our habits. So uh, what we wanted to depict is actually how close it came to our uh, hearts, our minds and our bodies. Uh, so many things that we take as a norm today and we take it for granted today would be completely mind blowing only 15 years ago. Um, for example, we follow the information and we get the information uh, real time. Uh, we can shop uh, and socialize uh, behind the screen. Uh, we rely on Google to know everything uh, that pops uh, in our mind. And we talk to people who are in a completely um, uh, remote uh, parts of the world. Um, and in our work, we like to draw attention to these gradual changes and to actually analyze what we as a society are adapting to and what we are now taking as the new normal. So let's talk about how technology uh, redefined and challenged uh, communication between us, and then also our ability to focus, and how it even attempts to challenge our reality. So uh, communication. Um, the first time we got intrigued uh, in how technology is changing communication between people is when we moved uh, from Belgrade to Amsterdam. And uh, we actually continued our communication with friends through social networks, uh, how it usually happens. Uh, but soon we discovered that we were having uh, the whole conversation about where people were or what they were doing, or also how they expressed each, uh, how they express themselves. themselves and how they communicate with, with each other only based on what they shared online. So we were actually less motivated to meet new people and socialize with our immediate environment as we were socializing with already familiar friends from back home. And uh, this also goes the other way around. So today you can feel closer to the someone living on another part of the planet who you have never met in person than with your neighbor who you grew up with. So with, with digital technology, what happens is that actually cultural identity goes beyond national linguistic, linguistic and also geographical borders. Um, just a moment, yeah. I, I think we're having a problem with video slides. Hmm. Uh, let's, uh... Did, did anyone else had this problem earlier or? Okay, okay. great. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, at the time uh, I was reading a psychology book uh, called Games People Play by Eric Byrne. Uh, and because we were spending so much time online, uh, it led me uh, to think and led us to, to uh, discuss what are the psychological games that people play uh, in online environment. Uh, where you cannot see the body language of the person you are talking to and where the communication is already limited by this um, predefined uh, interface design. So uh, the communication is in that sense uh, fragmented. Uh, we only see uh, bits and pieces of it uh, through likes and comments um, and through also content that is curated because we of course try to present the best version of ourselves uh, online. Uh, and as interface design changes, so does the communication. 
Um, so, uh, for example, we got used to um, uh, express, expressing our specific feelings through memes or filters. And sometimes these uh, emotions are so specific that we wouldn't be able, and, and this humor is so specific that we wouldn't be able to actually put it in any other uh, way. We wouldn't be able to put it in words. And because of Twitter, we learned to uh, write and summarize our thoughts in 140 uh, characters. Uh, then we also, um, when we take a photo, we uh, think of a caption for it. Um, and in that way, uh, as society is changing, also uh, the technology and social media is changing. But the social media is changing, uh, it is also adapting to, to the needs of the society. So in that sense, um, whichever is the egg and whichever is the, the chicken in, in this uh, situation is really uh, hard to tell as they are both uh, fueling and feeding uh, from each other. And then we started uh, the project Dictionary for Online Behavior. Uh, it is uh, the dictionary of new words that we invented uh, for the phenomena that emerged from social networks. So each word is presented through explanation and examples. And this part is very similar to, to the dictionaries that we are uh, all uh, used. Uh, that, that we, uh, this part is very similar to traditional dictionaries. Uh, but what is different is that each uh, term is also presented through a short uh, GIF-like animated video as a popular internet form. Uh, so let's uh, show some examples of the words. Uh, trillification, it's a trill about getting notifications. So as you probably know, we get a hit of dopamine, which is released in happy and exciting uh, situations every time we, we see the notifications. And this is actually the core and the base of our addiction and the principle on which the, the socials is built and also monetized. So this monetization uh, comes largely from ads and basically advertise, advertisers are paying for our attention to their ads. And we do end up scrolling our timelines because of this dopamine release. Uh, and uh, very interesting is that I recently heard a quote uh, that the only two industries that refer to their customers as users are the illegal drug industry and the software industry. And then uh, other term uh, is half seen. It's a phenomenon when somebody sends you a message, but you don't want to open uh, because uh, you're not in the mood to reply immediately. So if you open, the other person will get this little scene that you, you have uh, at the bottom of your message. And then uh, you might be perceived as rude or maybe as lazy for not replying straight away. This one is a particularly interesting because it is actually the UX UI designers that designed this little scene. And uh, it later on created, uh, created this whole anxiety in society uh, that we have to be available all the time and that we have to reply to our messages instantly. So it's, it uh, basically changed the, the whole culture of texting and ultimately it's the only, uh, it's a very small change in the interface design. And then uh, forcing, it's a selfie that you don't voluntarily take part in, but you are forced by someone's enthusiasm. Uh, I find this one to be interesting uh, because it actually changed the way we spend time offline. Uh, so we spend our offline time together uh, making selfies and forces in order to post them online. Uh, and around the time we wrote and defined Forsy, selfie was uh, announced as the word of the year uh, by Oxford Dictionaries. So uh, we knew that we are that it is a hot, uh, that it is a hot topic and that we are on the right track. Let's say. And then uh, follower ratio. It's the ratio of followers uh, to followings. Do you want to be followed, or do you want to be a follower? Bear with me and I will teach you how to reach that perfect follower ratio. You have to show interest in others. So just like, 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 comment, 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 
and follow, follow, follow. Once you get people to follow you back, reverse it. Just unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. It's that easy. Believe me, you'll go from an average person to an influencer in a month. So uh, what we showed in this uh, satirical explainer is a strategy that emerged on social media and uh, it's usually uh, used by influencers and brands. Um, and we find it uh, so uh, interesting because it is so generic on one hand, um, you follow as many people as possible, but then um, you rely on basic human traits such as showing back the interest. Uh, so people follow you back and then you unfollow them in order to have more followers than followings. So um, this is uh, important in terms of uh, social capital uh, and social capital uh, is uh, yeah the, the number of, of followings um, uh, and it is actually and likes and likes yeah and, and and actually it's it's uh, important uh, in real world in, in for, for some profession it's really important because um, for example, for actors or, or models or people working in entertainment industry, uh, it is not unusual to get asked uh, how many um, followers uh, you have if you, if you want to, to cast for a specific role um, or to promote a brand, uh, because production companies and brands are relying on these individuals uh, followings and audience. Um, and then uh, timeline climate uh, is the idiom uh, and it stands for prevailing feeling or opinion on a timeline at a certain moment. Um, and we, we had this with COVID so obvious. Um, so at some point, uh, everybody was talking about the situation in China. Uh, then it transferred to the situation in Italy. Uh, then there was this uh, uh, prevailing, uh, yeah, our whole time, uh, timelines were filled with uh, jokes about how to spend your quarantine, how to survive your uh, quarantine. Um, and then uh, again, it transferred to uh, global protests such as uh, Black Lives Matter uh, or uh, Greece, uh, what was happening in Greece uh, or Minsk or Serbia. Um, so what we often tend to, to forget about this, um, uh, about our timeline is that we see a very leveled uh, opinion or, or very leveled uh, specific emotion to, towards uh, an event. Uh, but actually we tend to uh, gather people around us who share similar opinions like us. Uh, but also we, um, also the algorithms are actually tailoring our content towards our interests. So we sometimes think that what we see on our timeline is, um, is, an, is a public opinion, but it's actually our own uh, bubble. And then feed noise, uh, it's a noun, and it's real time clutter of information on other people's lives on the feed, but also information on happenings in the world. So uh, as you know, we live in information era and sometimes this speed at which we get the information and the variety of it can become so overwhelming. So for example, our parents had the problem to get to information while for us, uh, the being flooded by information uh, be, become the new way of censorship, let's say. And uh, the, the, the uh, very interesting fact is in, uh, that in the first two years of the internet, there was a bigger cir circulation of information uh, than in the whole history of civilization. Yeah. So to go back to the beginning, yeah, at the beginning, uh, we were like trying to, to figure out how um, to construct our observations. So we wanted to write uh, new uh, rules that are imposed on social media. And then we wrote down a couple of modern proverbs. For example, where did you take this photo is the new where did you buy this piece? Uh, so we try so hard to curate our timelines with nice photos from all over the world. Uh, and at some point, Instagram actually uh, uh, became to stimulate tourism in this, in this sense and to, to actually promote some very photogenic places. Uh, so what uh, social media has done is uh, uh, to make everyone accessible for a comparison. In the past, uh, people would compare themselves with people from their environment. 
but now they're actually competing with the whole world. And then we were trying to figure out uh, in which form should this uh, project be, because we had uh, many uh, scattered uh, thoughts and, and proverbs, like the, the one that uh, Theodora said, uh, but then it all uh, boiled down and came to, to these expressions that we defined. Um, and at the time, uh, we decided to make a website, uh, and then we were searching for a good metaphor, a good element to present uh, this story on the website. Uh, and because this project is not about digitization, uh, so we didn't want to take a, a regular um, uh, dictionary book and just translate it to uh, the online medium. Uh, we uh, actually wanted to, in a way, reinvent the form because this is about digitalization and the impact of uh, digitalization. So uh, we thought that a tab would be a perfect element to tell this story. Uh, because tabs are what people used earlier to archive, organize, and write the old dictionaries. Uh, and tabs are also, also uh, what is constructing our browser window uh, for the internet today. Uh, so this is how the website looks. Uh, there are now around 25 words. Uh, so if you're curious to read more, uh, we invite you to, to visit the website. Uh, also, what we did is that at some point we included other people to work with us on this project, so other artists, designers, but also writers. And it was very important for us because it's not only our personal perspective, but rather the perspective of the whole uh, generation that is one of the last generations that are actually um, not digital natives. So we always love to see people participating in this project. Uh, it's always uh, so interesting to see how these new words uh, live and how people use uh, hashtags. Uh, for example, I often make uh, forces with my cat. And then later on, we discovered that uh, many other people um, do, do, do forces <laughs> with their cats, uh, but also with their grandmas. So uh, yeah, these are uh, all of the words. And then uh, focus, how technology Im impacted our focus. Um, so uh, we noticed that technology uh, has changed the way we focus and that uh, actually uh, we have a very hard time uh, staying in on offline environment and that we often drift to uh, offline uh, online environment that is uh, much more stimulating, much more uh, fast. Uh, and we have a um, hard time um, uh, not being stimulated all the time. Uh, so we're used to, to sensationalism uh, and stimuli, um, and we are highly intolerant to boredom. Uh, we also often uh, jump from a tab to, to a tab. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we would never give up the, the technology as designers and uh, as millennials, we would never give up the, the modern technology. Uh, but, uh, and, and some people do, some people who realize this problem, uh, they go back to the old phones. Uh, but for us, this meant that uh, we should probably be starting a new project. Uh, and with uh, this in mind, we Googled our assumptions. Uh, humans have shorter attention span than goldfish. Uh, so, yeah, so we, um, we saw this and then we uh, googled uh, our assumptions uh, and, then, uh, and then we realized that uh, how uh, people actually can uh, measure the attention span of the goldfish. Uh, so we realized that there are a lot of this uh, kind of um, titles. And what, what was ironical is that actually uh, the, the articles about shortened attention spans were designed so that it grabs your attention. Uh, so here's a short background of uh, distractions. Uh, this is uh, Skinner's box. Uh, and Skinner was a psychologist uh, who introduced the concept of variable reward. Uh, so pigeons would pack, and when they pack, they would get food. Um, and first group of pigeons would get food each time they pack, and it was a certain amount of food. But the second group of pigeons would get food only after a random amount of packing, and also it would be a random amount of food. 
So what happened is that the first group of pigeons uh, who knew that they would get food, uh, they would only pack when they were hungry. Uh, and the second group of pigeons were practically hooked up. So they were uh, packing all the time uh, because they were in this expecting mode. Uh, and if this sounds uh, familiar to you, this is because uh, slot machines work like that. Uh, but also social media works uh, in the same way. So uh, we check our phones uh, on average, I read somewhere 150 times uh, a day. Um, and sometimes we do get notifications and sometimes these notifications are very uh, pleasant. Uh, so um, uh, they are, for example, likes and nice comments, but sometimes there are also invitations to, to places where we don't want to go to. So it's a variable reward. And with this story in mind, uh, we initiated the project um, Attention Spam. Uh, and one of the inspirations for the project was the modern proverb, sitting is the new smoking, which you may uh, have heard of already. Uh, so we decided to put it literally in a form of a cigarette warning labels, because we are so distracted uh, and immersed online. Uh, we so often forget about our physical bodies, which leads to hours of sitting and actually, uh, and actually the same cardiovascular diseases as smoking. And there are many apps such as Calm and Budify, for example, that try to, to make phones our companions in trying to, to re reconnect with ourselves. But we wanted actually to propose the solution which is outside of, of online world, uh, the ones that will stand in our immediate uh, space. Uh, so we, uh, we decided to launch a collection of physical objects and we created actually a fashion uh, for our clothes, uh, ourselves. This is some of the pieces that we created and also for our phones. Uh, so yeah, the, the collection was made possible by a brand from New York with whom we uh, teamed up. Uh, and then we also uh, wanted to, to make um, uh, a campaign uh, on social media, of course. Uh, and these are some of the photos from campaign. Um, and then we thought because uh, filters became a thing uh, and they were globally recognized as a, as a phenomenon. Uh, as part of the campaign, we also made uh, these uh, uh, filters, face filters. Uh, so by blinking, you get uh, either yes or no. So you decide whether you are a social media addict uh, or not. And then uh, as part of the same promotion, um, uh, we also made these questionnaires. And I love uh, polls on social media because they give you access to so many people at the same time and you get to hear uh, the opinion uh, of, of people. So we wanted to investigate how people relate to their uh, phones and to their uh, gadgets. Uh, and we posed many questions. <laughs> so some of them are, uh, I often pull out my phone as an impulse. Uh, and scrolling through feed uh, rarely gives me uh, a positive kick, yet I do it daily. And as you can see, most of the answers were yes, around 80%. I use the phone on the toilet. Um, <laughs> this was a tricky one. And then um, uh, that feeling of being judged, uh, that feeling for spending of for, time. For spending time. <laughs> yeah, I cannot read it because of the, the screen uh, on top. For, yeah for spending time on the phone, uh, but kind of not caring uh, because the thing that I'm looking at is so much uh, fun. So that one is about staying uh, in the online environment mentally while you're of course physically offline. Um, the last thing I see before sleep uh, is my phone uh, and I check my notifications first thing in the morning. Um, again, many positive answers, um, meaning that we go to bed with our phone and we wake up uh, with our phone. So surely it does uh, have impact also on our dreams. And uh, that brings us to the part of uh, reality. So, uh, so far we've spoken how um, interface design and how technology has influenced our communication uh, and also our habits. Uh, but it literally attempts to also uh, change our uh, and challenge our reality. Uh, and that is true VR, AR, and MR. 
And the first uh, VR we, we did was for kids, uh, and it was for uh, one of the biggest uh, festivals in Europe that actually introduced uh, cutting edge technology and new technology to kids. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, the experience stimuli in VR can be very joyful, but they can be also very scary. Um, and, that, and because of that, uh, we didn't want to traumatize children, of course. But we didn't grow up with VR, with VR, so we couldn't possibly know what is scary in VR for the kid uh, age five. So we, with this project, we tested on ourselves a lot and on a couple of, of brave uh, kids. Uh, since this work was made for digital natives, we decided to make a joyful ride that will na naturally implement the language of social media and put them in. Um, uh, unexpected places. Uh, so we took references from Candy Crush, Google Maps, and um, emojis. What we soon realized uh, with working on this project is that kids have the ability to build fantastical elements if you sparkle their imagination. They're already so easily altering the reality. So it was interesting to see how they built on top, uh, on top of the experience and talk about the things uh, that were not even uh, happening in VR. And it made us wonder um, about the influence VR can have on kids. Uh, because uh, sometimes children uh, remember things from childhood that didn't happen or that are exaggerated. So for us, the big question was, uh, will they remember something uh, they experienced in VR as real? Yeah, and that uh, got us also uh, to question because this is the first time that uh, a designer is actually um, able to create the whole environment. Uh, how big is the impact uh, that, that it can have? Um, as you might know already, uh, VR has been used in many medical studies to cure phobias and PTSD. Um, so, uh, for example, so in, in that sense, the influence can be uh, quite uh, big. And the question is, are we as designers um, equipped to carry such uh, responsibility? Uh, and can we somehow um, by accident make a wrong or hurtful experience for someone? Mm -hmm. And then the second um, VR we did was um, interesting for completely different reasons. Um, it's a VR we did for Burberry brand. Um, and I think, uh, one of the, the main motivations to, to, uh, for production company to approach us to make this uh, was actually uh, because of how easy it is to mask London. So the brief was to, to make London in kind of uh, Burberry uh, clothing, uh, let's say in Burberry branding. Uh, so it was of course way easier production wise to, to do it all uh, in animation uh, and, and in VR than to actually go and have uh, shooting days uh, in London. Um, uh, yeah, these are some scenes from the experience. And uh, yeah, of course, what we see uh, happening uh, today with COVID is also the, the same. I mean, because uh, now people are not able to travel as much as they, uh, as much as we all uh, could. Um, we, we get to meet in these virtual spaces and also uh, some digital shoots are happening with models such as Lil Michaela uh, or, or similar digital models. And uh, also, uh, for example, digital fashion shows are happening. Uh, events are organized in, in, in virtual space. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, VR is at this moment because of COVID uh, gaining uh, momentum. I just never taken the time to appreciate London and walk around even just in the gardens and like lying down in the meadows or playing by the lake or actually finding the nature within London. Yeah, and wouldn't it be nice in, during the lockdown to, to go somewhere and to escape even uh, to virtual reality? Uh, so uh, the last uh, work I'm going to speak about uh, briefly is uh, the work we did for a festival here in the Netherlands. Um, so 
as said, we were very uh, impressed by uh, how big uh, filters became because they are basically uh, putting on and projecting a digital uh, layer onto our bodies. Um, and, and this was globally uh, recognized. So uh, in this work, what we want to do is to um, basically give filters a bit more meaning than the aesthetical purpose than they had, um, than they have. Uh, so uh, we made three chapters uh, about three prominent topics in 2019, uh, and we uh, presented them through filters. So uh, social media users, are uh, protagonists of the story and uh, the filter is actually the story. So the first chapter is about uh, consumerism. Uh, as you might know, uh, since the birth of social media, uh, the sales of clothing has increased by 60%. There is this pressure in society to show uh, always, and especially a pressure on influencers and, and public persona to always show themselves in new clothing uh, on social media. Uh, but also it is due to, uh, of course, the advert, uh, ads being um, um, more available online and shopping being more facilitated due to social media uh, online. So these are some of the images of the filter. And then uh, the next chapter is uh, the narcissist. So. Um, yeah, with, in social media uh, is definitely tapping on this uh, egocentric need to uh, express and uh, impress. And face, face filters are providing even more excuse to um, take another selfie and, and post it uh, and obsess with, with self-image. And like Narcissus who once uh, fell into the lake uh, um, uh, looking at his uh, reflection, um, the social media users um, fall in love with each uh, new selfie uh, taken. And the last uh, chapter is How Dare You? Uh, so what we uh, recently saw with Black Lives Matter movement and other global protests is that social media can be used to drive movements and fuel debates. So uh, now being an influencer almost became a synonym to being an activist. Uh, here specifically with this filter, we focused on teenage activist Greta Thunberg, uh, who is a phenomenon emerged actually from social media and who gave a fierce speech towards the end of 2019 uh, that uh, set the internet on fire. Yeah, so the, the last chapter is uh, about um, activism. Um, and these were the three prominent topics that we, that we thought were very important on social media in 2019 and still continue to be in 2020, I guess. Um, so to summarize, uh, we talked about uh, how we use technology on a daily basis uh, and how it has changed us on both uh, personal and um, uh, more global uh, level. Um, but most importantly, uh, it inspired us to create the work we did and it enabled us to uh, share it now also with you. Um, uh, wherever you're sitting, I heard there were many countries participating uh, in this uh, conference. Um, so uh, yeah, that is, I guess, the, the most important part about uh, technology that, that should be said for the end. Uh, and I think uh, we can now Thank you for your attention, and I'm not sure if whether we have time for further questions. The Q and A. Yeah. Thanks, guys, so much. It's um, so interesting. I wonder how many people on this um, conference stood up from their chairs when they saw your cushion si sitting as the new smoking. I jumped out of my seat immediately. <laughs> I'm looking at those <laughs> filters. Um, I'm wondering how we get. How do people get hold of those filters? Are they all readily available still, or are they project specific? If people want to have a look at them and try them out themselves. So uh, yeah, the filters are available uh, through our uh, social, so through our uh, profile on Instagram. Um, yeah, for people, I guess some people know where to find them. It's in, in the in in the tab. Yeah, it's a bit hard Perfect. to explain. <laughs> I don't know. So if it's, possible to like this. it's in a tab uh, next to the the grid, uh, so they can be tried out there. And um, yeah. And uh, if there are any questions from uh, from the delegates who are, who are listening, who are on the Zoom room with us, I'm just gonna give them 60 seconds to type a question in capital letters, please, so we can see it really clearly. 
um if there aren't any then we'll move on but it would be great if there is if there is a question or two that we might throw at you i wish that london looked quite as beautiful as it did in that burberry uh vr <laughs> <laughs> um yeah let's see if there are any questions coming yeah there are no traffic no traffic jams in london right <laughs> No, <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? No traffic, green spaces, <laughs> flowers on the street, balloons in the telephone boxes. <laughs> yeah, I think we can stop sharing screens and so on. I don't think there are any questions coming. Okay, so if are you going to stay with us, the two of you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Great. So if there are if there are any questions that come up later, then you can reply to them uh, or they can come to you privately if you're still with us in this Zoom room. But thank you so much. Um, so much to think about and some amazing imagery and uh, to, 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 to just um, what's the word? Absorb. Thank you. Yeah, um, we will. We will hopefully um, be able to speak to you later on, on the chat via the chat. So thanks, guys, so much. Yeah, thank you. Great. All thank right. You. Um, so we're going to move on now to our next panel discussion and that uh, panel discussion is entitled Hyperconnectivity and Future Digital Societies, How Design and Technology Impact the Way that We Relate to Each Other. And Atilim Sahin is facilitating this. Um, Atilim, are you there? Yes. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, hello, beautiful people. It's a pleasure to be here with all these brilliant minds. My name is Atulum. Uh, I'm connecting from Istanbul. I'm the Creative Hub Director at Atelier, uh, one of the partners for this project, and the Secretary General at European Creative Hubs Network. Uh, I don't have that much time to talk about myself today because we have much more important topics to discuss. Uh, here's what we are going to do. I have five billion speakers for you today to challenge your mind uh, and to create new sparks in your brain. How? Today, we are going to talk about how design and technology impact the way we relate to each other. And we're going to mention the future of our digital societies. We will also talk about the new forms of the social norms where we include the machines as a new medium to define our interactions with each other. This may be a series of presentations, and we will have a Q&A session at the very end after listening five talks. So if you have any questions during the presentations, please put them in the chat box, but note that your questions will be answered after we hear five presentations. As we did throughout today, please type your questions in capital letters and mention the speaker name that you would like to address your questions to. So now, uh, please sit back, fasten your seatbelts, take a breath, make sure that you have enough popcorn to keep you, and enjoy listening to these inspiring conversations. Here comes our first dear speaker. I would like to welcome Daphne Drogona to the stage. Daphne is a creator and writer based in Berlin. She worked as a creator for the Transmediale Festival from 2015 to 19. Today, she is going to talk about her project called Engineering Care. It's a super interesting project where she engaged artists, designers, technologists, and activists that produce works around how we will live and work with machines and, how, uh, and speculating how relationships, dependencies might change. Let's listen more from her. Uh, Daphne, are you with us? Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi there. Hi there, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Atelim. And a big thanks also to Vasilis and Akis for inviting me and to the organizers as well. I will start right away. Just let me share my screen. Daphne, mm -hmm. uh, are you able to see the chat box yes. while you are presenting? The chat box? Uh, no, I can't see the chat box right now. Okay, great. I need to be quite sharp with the timings as we already started the session 15 minutes late. So okay. I will kindly I'll... interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, please do. But I will also set an alarm. <laughs> so right, I'll great. keep track of time. Don't worry. Sure. Okay. Uh, so what I will be talking about is um, uh, the topic of care technologies. And uh, as Atim said, it's a topic that I engaged with in the last, let's say, one to two years with different projects of mine. 
Um, so in a way, uh, we could say that the engineering of care is already here. Uh, social robots, um, online bots, virtual assistants are becoming more and more common uh, at work, at home, in, uh, let's say, different situation and situations and environments. And um, artificial companions like uh, Pepper, um, Siri or Alexa have arrived promising that they will inform us and entertain us, that they will provide guidance and keep us company. Now, the interesting thing about these systems is that they are equipped uh, with uh, face or voice recognition, in some cases with both. And uh, they are machines that basically can, let's say, see us or hear us, and they can respond to our requests by continuously learning from our interests and habits. So we could say that they are here to uh, organize and optimize everyday life. And they change, therefore, not only how we relate to technology, but also how we relate to each other. Now, there are three questions that I would like to raise as, as let's say, starting points, which are the following. So what feelings um, do technologies of care evoke and which behaviors do they encourage? What role do they play or promise to play in different contexts? And why did they become common? Why did they become popular recently or let's say now? So. Uh, in order to address these questions, I will uh, br very briefly present uh, different projects that address this topic. I will start with uh, Software Garden, a project by Rory Pilgrim, which is a performance. Here's a picture from Transmedia 2019. Uh, part of uh, what the audience is experiencing at the Software Garden is written by poet and disability advocate, Carol Cullen. Carol is the person that we see at the projection at the far back. So Carol, uh, as part of, the, let's say, the performance, expresses her wish for a world where um, humans and machines and robots would live harmoniously with each other. And Pepper that we see here is um, a classic example of a social robot uh, that is equipped with cameras, with sensors, with mics, with LEDs, and this facilitates its interaction with humans. Now, a robot like um, Pepper, as we uh, hear at the performance, would comfort Carol because it would make her feel safe. It would make her, um, let's say, it would comfort her and help her respond to the harsh reality that she's uh, facing in UK after the disability cuts. Now, on the um, hard side of things, the truth is that um, robots are hardly, social robots are hardly developed um, let's say, to the point that they can offer the services that um, they promise. And what is not being discussed so much is how they will uh, capture, process and classify human, human behavior in order to offer these services. This project is uh, the work Alexiety by Media Group Abitnik and Lojak. And uh, it's a work that uh, the artist developed in order to capture and discuss the feelings that users develop towards uh, personal intelligent assistance. The um, work is very much uh, built around uh, an album of three songs that they wrote and um, that they used in a way to interact with systems like uh, Alexa or Siri. So one of these um, lyrics that I have singled out here says, Alexa, you creep me. While another one, for instance, says, Alexa, you're getting better and better at anticipating the voices, the moods around you. Uh, so Alexa maybe is the most familiar uh, example of what we could call a care technology uh, nowadays and has uh, voice features. So like um, uh, most intelligent uh, assistants, it can detect the physical characteristics of a voice and also the emotional tone of a human voice. So systems like um, Alexa can locate um, the ethnic origin, the language accent, the gender, the age, and the mood of the user. So all in all, we are kind of uh, seeing that uh, they expose users to a new form of continuous surveillance. And this happens in a way, in the softest possible way. Moving on, uh, this is a project called Macho Sounds, Gender Noise. Uh, it's a project that was created by artist Sofia Donna and myself recently. We presented it at the Staatsgalerie in Stuttgart last July as part of the Retirte Stadt Festival. 
And um, what we try to do in this uh, project is to discuss the um, role of sound in the reproduction of gender stereotypes, specifically looking into the car industry. The reason that I bring, in, bring it in here is that we also wanted to comment on the gender of the machinic voice. So as part of the um, project, we have an animated text running, and this is one of uh, its phrases, its lines that I will quickly read for you. The voice that helps you navigate, calls home, plays music and podcasts, adjusts the temperature, shows gas stations, and proposes restaurants is female. So here we are discussing the role of, the, of systems like Alexa when they enter, let's say, the car um, environment. And we are kind of arguing that the voice is female because it creates a feeling of uh, familiarity, because it builds associations to roles that are traditionally undertaken by women. Uh, it builds associations to um, women because they're considered to be more attentive to someone's needs, because they are the ones that, um, let's say, have been engaging with affective or invisibilized labor. Now, the thing is that when this happens, when machines seen as female undertake all the small things, like the ones that uh, are mentioned here in the test, that in the text, then there is the fear that women as well might be seen in reverse as technology. And this is what Shara Sharma is kind of pointing out in her beautiful work. She's a feminist scholar. And the last project that I would like to bring in is a project by Carolyn Sinders called Carebot. Uh, Carolyn developed this project last year as part of uh, the project, um, the web residencies uh, program uh, called Engineering Care. Uh, the general framework is uh, uh, something, it's a program produced by CETKM and uh, the Academy Slow Solitude. And uh, uh, as part of this uh, project, what uh, Carolyn did was that she basically wanted to develop a bot, to, to program a bot that would um, um, somehow discuss the problem of online harassment in the social media. Uh, what is interesting here, and I, I, that's why I also bring it in specifically, is that at some point we even read a line saying, I'm a bot, not a therapist. So Carolyn highlights that um, this is a bot that can provide information. This is a bot that underlines the problem, but it cannot become um, a therapist. It cannot provide psychological support. Um, a bot like the machines that we are discussing do not have um, cognitive or sentient capacities to do that. So it kind of um, sets the limit of where we are. Uh, and now to, in a way to conclude, uh, I would like to say that the technologies such as the ones that I mentioned and uh, discussed are in my opinion, the effective infrastructures of our times. And they are effective I would argue not only because, um, let's say, they capture and uh, they process feelings, they are also effective for the promises that they come to fulfill. So the social robots, the intelligent personal assistants, the bots and different types of software that come in today for this reason have all appeared at the time of a generalized crisis, have all appeared at the time um, of a crisis which is linked to a crisis of work, linked to a crisis of care. This is something that um, scholars like Nancy Fraser and Helen Hester are discussing. And uh, this is something important to take in mind because the technologies, the care technologies come in to fill in gaps. They come in to, to restore bonds that have been broken. And of course, the question is to which extent this can happen as these are systems that are being introduced um, by the market. In some cases, they are supported by governments. And what we see is a form of care that to a great extent is having to do with an instrumentalization of care itself. Now there are gaps, but there are also cracks. And this is probably what I would like to end with. And uh, the cracks found in these systems is what the artists, let's say, locate and point at with their work, um, inviting us to kind of, uh, let's say, see through the cracks and get new perceptions, get new perspectives about how these technologies work, but also how maybe they can change. Because the, the future of care technologies on a great, to a great extent depends on the attention we pay and we will pay to them. And on the critical reflection that is needed about their operation, about their promises, about their processes, about how they are enforcing uh, forms of classification, regulation and control. So all in all, and to return to my first question, 
it is not really about so much about how Alexa or Pepper make us feel, but it is rather about the world which is being built around such systems and um, about the, the way that this will um, affect everyday life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daphne. It was super interesting work. Thanks for sharing us. I was particularly interested in uh, the cracks part that you lastly mentioned. Uh, super interesting to hear. So I would like to invite you uh, to put your questions or comments down in the chat box if you have any. We will have them uh, answered at the end by Daphne. So uh, uh, let's move on to our second speaker. Uh, I would like to invite, invite Joan Cekic from Belgrade. Uh, today, he is going to talk about digital capitalism and the society of control. He will touch upon the pandemic situation where new normal becomes something which Gilles Deleuze calls as society of control. Together with Joan, explore if we could make the future of digital society to become real-time democracy. Joan, are you with us? Yes, hello. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will speak uh, about uh, digital capitalism and uh, society of control, which means uh, this is the notion which Gilles Deleuze uh, um, used 30 years ago, you know, and uh, what is the very important for us now that everybody thinks that we are actually living in a society of uh, control. So uh, what is, in my opinion, very, very, uh, let's say very important in this, that actually we are living in a very complex and autonomous world. So we need some time, some kind of the long-term thinking. Uh, why we need that and uh, how we, actually think about this world. First of all, we are living in the world of uh, crisis. We, we have unseen levels of inequality, uh, environmental degradation, climate destabilization, and of course, populism, conflicts, economic uncertainty, and so on. So this is actually complex and autonomous world. Uh, what is the very important in this approach is that uh, when we are speak about digital capitalism, it means that uh, every society has or corresponding in a particular kind of machine. So despotic societies is corresponding to the similar machines, it's very simple machines like levers or clocks, you know. Disciplinary society is uh, corresponding to thermodynamics machine or you know, for this and, and things like that. And the uh, society of control, which is now we are entering, is operate with a machine of third generation, which means computers. So uh, if you are talking about control of population, is actually a different kind or a different way how we organize space of enclosure. In a disciplinary society, it was, uh, let's say, some kind of the molds or boxes, you know, and then you are passing from, uh, in one's, let's say, line, you are passing from uh, uh, one box to the other box, from family to the school, then from the air, army, then to the factory, maybe hospital, maybe possibly prison and things like that. So what you have there, that is a different model of enclosure. And uh, you are always have to start from the beginning. You are always have to learn uh, something in a new box. But uh, in a society of control, uh, we seems to us that we have no any boundaries, that we are open and free. But actually, we have some kind of the limits, which is invisible enclosure. And uh, uh, if you want to pass it, if you want to uh, uh, go further, you need some code or you need password. Well, that's 
Access that will I, I able you to access to information or to reject it. Also, if you have some e card, you can go. You can go from one place to the other place. In other way, we really live in that complex world. And if we want, you know, to to move further, we really need to rethink that concept of control. Why? Well, first of all. It is 30 years ago. Then the second things, uh, Gilles Deleuze didn't know for new, let's say, development that we are coming in the epoch, which is called Anthropocene. Also, we have climate change or destabilization, and uh, we almost produce artificial intelligence. So if we are looking closer on those new situation, we will see that Anthropocene is something which science says, well, okay, Homo sapiens became a geological force, which means we need to control that force. Why? Because in one moment, if it is real, there is no difference anymore between nature and society. So, Human activity can produce implosion of civilization or irreversible, irreversible damage to the system of the earth. What we need then? Well, we need some kind of non-anthropocentric approach, which means the human is not separate from any other, you know, entity and natural environment. Uh, which, mean, which means that uh, World is not the collection, you know, of the isolated object, but it's a network of phenomena which is fundamentally interconnected and interdependent. So we need to think on a new way. We need to think, let's say, on the long term thinking. Uh, if we are thinking about climate change, everybody, you know, focus on discussion, who is to, who is to blame for it? Is it the nature, uh, normal process or human activity is blamed for it? But actually it doesn't matter at this moment if climate change is starting to accelerate. It means, first of all, we will have climate refugees. Then we will have clim climate nomads. And after that, we will have to create some civilization or the culture of multitudes. Well, look, Corona, we have global impact and let's, let's say local response. Everybody, every country is, you know, reacting in his own way. We have Sweden model, we have different other models, you know, and less or more close, but with climate change, and the uh, global impact, we must have global response. It means we cannot, you know, separate in that moment. If you are looking from that point of view, this is very new situation. And of course, we are nearly uh, uh, on the, on, let's say, to, to have uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, the guy who is working on that, one of the first, his name is Irving John Good, said that it is the last invention of the man. After that, you know, the man had nothing to invent. Actually, for him, the survival of the man depends on early construction of that ultra intelligent machine. Why? Because we are, as you know, in a complex world, world which is accelerate and change very, very fast. So where is the problem? The problem is that we don't know how to control that. He said that maybe the machine will be, let's say, polite enough to tell us how to control that. So it's a very funny situation. It's like, uh, you know, in a science fiction film, but we have a much more serious question. Can you imagine that we have any super intelligence entity to be privately owned by any country, by 
uh, any uh, you know corporation of or persons i think it's uh, very naive why why some uh, ultra intelligent entity except to be owned by anyone but it means why it accepts to be a slave when we analyze artificial intelligence it is just the part of collective arrangement machine is actually just one part and it means that we, we have to rethink the other component of collective arrangements. So, you know, when you are looking at different films, you will see that always robots and androids, we treat like a say, slave. So in this moment, we really have to think, is it possible to treat on that way some super intelligent entity? Well, on the end, we, have to think how to create two things, I think. The first is mentioned, it is the civilization of multi multitude. But the second one is some kind of real-time democracy. All the time we heard here how uh, artists react with the envir environment in the real time and things like that. But I think that now is the moment that we think of real-time democracy, which means that citizens there is on the first place. It means that not only the citizens is the object of controls, but also governments, corporations, and things like that, you know, institutions. So if we think about creations or creative, uh, we must have new type of creations of connections and interactions. And also we have, uh, we need new type of control, how we connect inter and interact with the world or earth, with the others and with non-human entity. Well, with real time democracy and civilization of uh, multitude, we maybe be capable to control our components of collective agreements, which means we will enter with a new connection with machine. And also we will, you know, don't have any boundary between us and machine, which means we will be in the post-human era. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Uh... I would like to quickly move to the next speaker. Uh, I'm quite stressed about the time. <laughs> so uh, our next guest is a research and design studio based in Amsterdam, Netherlands. It's called The Nero. The Nero studio was founded in 2015 by the architect duo of Panos Sakas and Potainis Etaki. I think today uh, both of them are going to be with us. Uh, I at BC Botany. The studio uses robotic 3D printing with recycled plastic to develop and implement circular design concepts of high aesthetic value and societal impact. Today, we are going to hear more about their work on co creating public space with robotic 3D printing and recycled plastics. Um, the Nero Studio, are you here? Botany? No, yes, we're here. Uh, hey. Thank you for the, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna start sharing my screen one minute. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, my name is Fatemi Setaki and together with Panos Akas, we are co-founders of uh, the new law, a design studio that is based in Rotterdam. Uh, what we do is to explore uh, different circular design uh, scenarios uh, in, a, uh, in combination with, uh, let's say, design and digital craftsmanship principle. Um, we started in 2015 uh, from the observation that we are a growing society, consuming a lot of resources and generating enormous amounts of plastic waste following a linear ap approach from consumption to discarding. 
So we wanted to show through our work what design can do in this, in this approach and suggest a circular uh, way of thinking. Um, a circular way of thinking uh, where we close uh, the loop of plastic waste locally by using uh, new, new technologies. Um, by using new technologies, uh, it's not only possible to add value to these discarded materials by making, uh, let's say, elements that are, uh, let's say, uh, high aesthetical value or could not be uh, produced in different ways uh, before. Uh, but also for us, uh, uh, from our point of view, it is, uh, let's say, a challenge to be able to involve uh, citizens, uh, both in the recycling process, but also in the making of the city. Uh, from a technical point of view, um, we started uh, to, uh, to uh, from uh, material tests, trying to understand whether it is possible, let's say, to 3D print uh, with recycled plastics. And soon we realized that actually uh, this um, was uh, relatively uh, easy to achieve, uh, but also gave us uh, advantages by, for example, giving us a, a this technology freedom of using many different materials uh, coming from single-use packaging like PET, HDP, PET, but also uh, by developing our own uh, production process, we were able to shorten uh, the material processing uh, approach. So uh, we could directly 3D print from washed and shredded uh, materials, skipping the, the paths of, uh, let's say, pelletizing and filament that you see in traditional 3D printing. Here you can see uh, a short video uh, of uh, how we work. So the first step uh, for recycling plastic is of course sorting and make sure that we have a clean material stream that we then shred and fit the, the extruder. The extruder is working in five different temperatures, melting the plastics, and in that way, we are able to reshape it in many different forms, uh, giving a new life, uh, like furniture pieces, uh, decorative elements, but also building components. Mm -hmm. So, um, Let's say uh, one part of the idea involving uh, robotic 3D printing in the recycling process of plastic, it is possible, but then how to involve uh, citizens in that and make them uh, uh, empower them to be participating and not only in uh, this, uh, the recycling part, but also in the making of furniture for their cities. Uh, for that, we have uh, developed a project called Bring Your City that we were able to test in a full city in Thessaloniki, in Greece. Uh, there we invited all the citizens of Thessaloniki to bring their plastic waste uh, to us so that we can, uh, uh, let's say, recycle it and make street furniture that is uh, customizable and be applied back in public space. To achieve that, we have developed an online uh, uh, design platform where citizens could uh, uh, log in uh, and actually in four very simple steps, uh, customize the new street furniture of the city, but also decide in which location to place um, uh, the new furniture. I would like to show you a bit uh, how we did that. Um, this was the website uh, that was uh, inviting citizens to customize their furniture. So the first step uh, of the decision-making was to decide uh, upon the shape of the furniture. And then uh, to customize it, uh, giving different functionality. So it could be, for example, a dance uh, that also has a, a bike rack, but also perhaps uh, has, a, let's say, a tree on it. 
The last step for customizing this uh, street furniture was uh, to choose the color of, uh, of it, uh, giving four different options to that. And at the end, uh, the user could uh, not only see uh, their design, uh, but also learn how much plastic they would need to, uh, let's say, uh, recycle in order to produce this furniture for the city. Uh, we had this uh, website online for uh, three weeks, and within these three weeks, we collected uh, 3,000 unique designs. Uh, by, let's say, collecting uh, all these different opinions, uh, we, we understood better what the citizens wanted for their city, but also what kind of, uh, what amount of materials we would need in order to produce it. For the... <clears throat> so here you see a few of, uh, let's say, the designs we have received, and, on the, and also how we have translated them into, let's say, printable designs. But in order to collect the material, we needed also, uh, let's say, a physical entity, a location in the city center, where we actually would uh, um, invite uh, the citizens to bring their plastic waste, but also uh, let them participate in the full uh, process of recycling. This was the entrance hall of uh, the Zero Waste Lab. And here you see, uh, uh, let's say the um, entrance hall, uh, where actually we had a short uh, exhibition explaining uh, the properties of the material, why it is important actually to, uh, to use this material in a thoughtful way, uh, but also why it makes sense to recycle it. Because of course, uh, plastic is a material that uh, um, has also advantages, like it's a material that is lightweight, it lasts for long, uh, it is also cheap, but very often we use it in the wrong way, for example, in single-use applications uh, that we uh, use for a bit and then we discard it. And in that way, we create bulk amounts of materials uh, that are discarded on a municipal level. So what we wanted to do is uh, not only, uh, let's say, uh, create motivation for recycling plastic, but also uh, let uh, the visitors understand also, uh, the importance of changing our consumption patterns and actually uh, use this material in a more thoughtful way. Uh, what had created a very big impact to our visitors was also, or what also, was also the possibility to see the full circle of the material from waste to product. Uh, because by making transparent the recycling process of plastic, uh, they could uh, realize that actually it's something uh, that it's a, it's a valuable material that can be formed again and again. And in that way, let's say, uh, uh, recycling makes sense. Uh, especially in uh, Greece, in Thessaloniki, there was a lot of uh, skepticism about whether recycling uh, takes place and whether, for example, even though there are um, recycling bins in uh, um, various locations in the city, uh, people often think that it doesn't make sense to recycle. And by making, uh, let's say, um, uh, this space in the city center, this production space in the recycling space, and making the recycling process transparent, uh, it gave motivation to people to come in again and again uh, to bring their plastic waste and give them a new shape and new life. Uh, the program lasted about six uh, months. And during this period, we were collecting and processing the material uh, of the citizens. Um, and at the end, we managed to implement 10 uh, furniture pieces in public space in a central location in Thessaloniki, uh, that uh, were the shape, colors, and the uh, extra functions of the furniture were shaped according to the 3,000 designs that we received earlier on that year. You see here different versions of our furniture that are, uh, let's say, customized in order, for example, to uh, host um, a food, uh, um, a dog feeder or a bike rack, uh, but also a position for planters. And what we are particularly proud of in this project is that actually we managed to close the loop of plastic waste uh, literally locally uh, within a radius of 15 kilometers. So the material was uh, uh, sourced, uh, processed, and then 3D printed and implemented uh, within uh, the borders of the city. 
and in that way, uh, let's say, actually uh, bring uh, um, uh, accommodate uh, the local uh, accommodate the concept of locally uh, recycling uh, plastic waste. So uh, that was a bit our project. So uh, in to our view, by using uh, new technologies like 3D printing, but also uh, let's say uh, digital design tools, it gives us uh, let's say a possibility to explore explore new concepts for recycling and thinking circular uh, by involving citizens not only in the recycling but also in the decision making process. Thank you. Thank you so much for Taini. It was super interesting to see you merge the participatory design processes together with the three three pinning to create impact for the city. Uh, I was amazed. Um, so we are gonna move to the upcoming presentation. But before that, I would like to is ask to my dear audience how they are. Are we alive? Give me some noise. Are you all sleeping? <laughs> Where are you? Mm. The depth and the intensity of the conversations are seriously fascinating, but sitting in front of the screen all day could also be devastating. As Teyosh mentioned in the previous keynote, sitting is the new smoking, right? Uh, so uh, maybe we, we need to uh, stand up for a while. Uh, I would like to invite you to stand up and scratch for a little while if you would like to join me. I need that desperately. So whether you join me or not, I think I'm gonna do that quickly. So uh, let me see who is joining me for that. So what we are gonna do is, is shake our body pants, uh, body parts for uh, for ten seconds, right? Uh, first right hand, and then left hand, and then right leg, left leg, and the head. Here it comes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Sorry, I need that seriously. I hope it will be as well. All right, we are continuing and moving to another inspiring speaker. We're going to go with Dani, admins, an Iranian English great and researcher based in Glasgow. She works across the interlinking fields of art, design, science, and technology. She is interested in the social and material entanglements that surface from extensively mapping worlds. So today, she will talk about the rise of smart ecological environments, rivers, forests, remote landscapes, and how this is changing the way we communicate, approach, and relate to the natural world. Danny, are you here? Yes, hi. Hi there. Thank you for the introduction uh, and the invitation. I'm also gonna just quickly jump straight in and try and stick to 10 minutes, because I know that time is short. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So across the globe, our oceans, rivers, and forests are fast becoming hyper-connected ecological environments. They're always on, readily available, information rich, interactive, machine to machine, and always recording. Animals carry sensors and collect data to force scientists to remote parts of the world that they cannot reach. Drones mass plant seeds, satellites detect melting ice sheets, and cryptocurrencies manage services that ecosystems provide. So in tandem with more analog human conservation practices, smart ecosystems increase the connectivity, knowledge, participation in, and control of these areas. But this is not new, however, the West have had a relatively long relationship with using monitoring and tracking technologies and data as a way to construct an image or an idea of nature and the world. So on the screen, you can see that in 1735, Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus introduced a system and nomenclature into biology 
that classified all living things into two classifications, animals and plants. And this has become the foundation on which biological classification still rests today. In 1943, the infamous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau developed a breathing regulator called the Aqualung that allowed everyday people to go underwater and scuba dive and uh, you know, radically alter humans' relationship with the underwater world. And in 2020, I don't have a photo for it, but Dr. Leon Barron, who with his team at the Imperial College London, are currently monitoring micro-polluting chemicals and pharmaceuticals that are found in the River Thames that come through the sewage system and they're excreted by Londoners. And they track the social patterns of this drug use and link them to wider social causes, such as the rise in London's depression and their use of antidepressants since the advent of Brexit. So you can see these world-making technologies have scientific, modern and colonial roots, and they aid in the construction of that truth, uh, truth about the world. So although fascinating, something the science doesn't help us gauge is the social and political consequences of these technologies and systems. How might these systems and technologies allow some to gain power and authority over others? And what inequalities are we putting in place unknowingly for the future? So I'm just going to talk, because I've got less than 10 minutes now, just about two works I've commissioned recently and then close with some reflections and remarks. Okay, so the first work I'd like to talk to talk to you is Tree Ball by the artist Maria Bozanowska Jones. And this is uh, a work I commissioned in 2018 as part of an exhibition I did on digital play and labor at Furtherfield Gallery in London. And this is a big co like a collaborative project and we had a co-creation lab that brought together artists and scientists and researchers to conceptualize ideas of digital play and labor. And Jones is really interested in the idea of the ways in which trees work for us. So trees clean the air we breathe, they work in symbiosis with mycorrhizal and fungal networks to talk to each other underground, they altruistically share resources, they provide cultural services in the form of shade and shelter, the humans, and they've been proven to reduce our anxiety. So in collaboration with a postdoc researcher, Robert Gallagher, who looks into gaming and identity at King's College London, she decided to create a number of monologues for three different tree species found in Finsbury Park, which is where the gallery is. So each anthropomorphized voice tells the story of the work that tree burrows perform, right, instead of laborers. So you can listen to an ASMR relaxing woodwide web beach who takes on the voice of a calming self-help guru. You can listen to a habitat oak talk about the logic of the gamification of all forms of life and work. And you can listen to an intellectual London plane pompously describing their work in an information economy. And when you listen to this piece, as you can see someone on the screen doing, um, these voices sound intimate and strange, other and familiar, and there's a couple of questions that I'd just like to pose to you. So if we valued or monetized the labor that trees do, would we make them work harder? Would we try to extract their labor as profit? And we could think about, you know, current debates and conversations around zero hours contracts, and, you know, as we're all stuck at home, um, but also this sort of we can think about feminist movement and feminist histories about domestic labor and how it wasn't included in the economy. And a question that I think is quite close to my heart is, do we live in a world where we need nature to economically perform as a way to recognize its value? So the, <clears throat> the next uh, work I'd like to talk about is called Declimatize by the designers Chris Verbken and Sasha Poplet. And as you can see, it's a long term, well, as you can see, it's a botanical installation, but it's a long term one. And it's for uh, a festival I commissioned in the Azores Islands in 2018. And the Azores are based in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in between Portugal and North America. And they're owned by Portugal. And they were a stopping off point for when Portugal was a great empire uh, or just an empire, sorry. Um, 
when they would transport sort of goods and plants, but also unfortunately people from the Southern hemisphere to the Northern hemisphere, the Azores was kind of like a big stopping off point. And the designers wanted to think about the colonial history of plants, how thousands of plant species were transported from, you know, more tropical climates into Northern Europe for agricultural industries in the 17th and 18th centuries. And, you know, the Azores itself sort of, uh, because of its temperate climate and lots of rainfall, it became a, a place where individual wealthy individuals would call themselves botanists and create acclimatization gardens. So these gardens are like sort of botanical gardens now, which are ruins, but they were then acclimatization gardens with loads of experiments going on and uh, which mostly failed. You know, these are mostly ideas of the future that failed. And so the designers thought, you know, now under the effects of anthropogenic climate change, it could be claimed that islands themselves are thrown into a type of motion. You know, in a hundred or so years, we have no idea what geographical location the Azores will be in terms of climate. So they worked with a local climatologist who'd created a simulation model of what the uh, climate will be like in the Azores Islands in 2100. So they find out the parameters of the weather and the precipitation, and then they spoke to lots of local botanists and gardeners and historians and selected a number of plants to thrive in this potential feature. And what you can see on the screen is a garden of these kind of future or predicted future, right? And like, it, I like to think of it as 25 square meters uh, into this kind of predicted future. And the stones around the side of it plot out a sort of pixel shape because you can see it uh, from the sky if you're a satellite. And what I think is really important about this work is it talks to us about the limitations of our ability to predict the future. And the design has really made it for not just humans, but more than humans. So this declimatization garden is actually to acclimatize birds and bees and insects into an anthropogenic future that, you know, these animals didn't ask for, and we don't really know what it's going to be. So just to close quickly, what these artworks speak to us about is our shifting relationship to what we consider today as nature. They question the role of technologies and systems in the construction of nature, but they don't just deconstruct that myth, they also sort of help us rethink our relationships, our roles and responsibilities. And I believe that such new understandings of the world are prerequisites for change, right? On one hand, we cannot keep nature at a distance for adoration and inspection. Nature is no longer a remote mountain peak shining in the sun, but it's also not a place of, you know, it's, not, it's also not a site just for uh, resource extraction. Nature is air pollution and is cloud servers. It is tide lines thickened with drift plastic and it is chemical pollutants causing gender differences in animal taxa. Nature is biology and botany and carbon and silica and matter and ideas. And all of this is being organized by systems of technology and capital. This new nature entangles us in ways we're only beginning to comprehend. And I sort of pose the question of what stories should we be telling? So thank you. I hope that was 10 minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, Danny. It was super uh, exciting uh, presentation where yeah, you also opened new doors in my mind when I, I think in terms of nature and technology and also like, uh, like thinking in terms of nature labor, I think it's a concept that I, I just uh, bump into very recently. Thank you. Uh, so we are moving on to our last speaker. Uh, I would like to invite Irini Papadimitru. Uh, she's a curator and cultural manager who is drawn interdisciplinary and critical discourse to explore the impact of technology in society and culture and the role of art in helping us engage with temporary issues. She's currently a creative director at Future Everything, an innovation lab and arts organization in Manchester. Uh, today, she will talk about how algorithmic systems are becoming essential bricks for building and reorganizing big parts of our society. So, Irini, are you with us? Hello, thank you, Atilim, and uh, thank you for the invitation to the event, uh, Akis and your team. So I'll just quickly share my screen so that we can 
start. Um, can you can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So, uh, so yes, so as, as Atilim said, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our work at Future Everything and my current curatorial research in uh, exploring how um, our, our obsession with uh, and accelerated adoption of algorithms in society and uh, across different sectors, but also um, how uh, these kind of uh, systems uh, makes us move towards uh, like uh, uh, seeing more and being seen through these uh, these filters. So I just wanted to uh, to start by sharing uh, this piece the, uh, on exactitude in science that I'm sure everybody is uh, knows very well by Borges, um, which uh, was uh, presented uh, as part of a travel book by a fictitious uh, writer Suarez Miranda and. Uh, is talking about an empire that has developed uh, a very, um, uh, uh, like, yeah, a, a, yeah, a really accelerated, a very advanced um, study of cartography and cartographic science that, uh, but also has ended up creating a map uh, and cartography as, as vast as the empire itself. And the reason why I wanted to share that is that it's something that I usually go back to um, thinking about quantification and our obsession with um, re with recollection, but also with uh, yeah, data collection and uh, and also thinking about uh, who we um, who we keep, like whose data is there and who is missing. Uh, this is um, the, these kind of questions were also um, explored in a project that we. Um, co-commissioned uh, by uh, artist Rafael Lozano Hemer and presented in Manchester last year in July 2019 and um, called Atmospheric Memory. And uh, Atmospheric Memory takes as a starting uh, inspiration and point um, the Charles Babbage and his um, treatise called the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise where he, from uh, 1800s, where he talks about the air as a, uh, as a library of uh, collecting everything that we've ever spoken about and every action that has ever happened. And, um, and Charles Babbage, the same uh, study in the same treatise, he talks about uh, a computer that will be powerful enough to um, rewind all this movement, all these words, all these actions in the atmosphere. And Raphael, with atmospheric memory, uh, it was his attempt to uh, try and materialize all of this that is unseen, all of these actions and um, data collection that, and, uh, and tracking that and quantification that is happening and trying to materialize it uh, in front of uh, our eyes. Um, so the installation would track uh, uh, people uh, throughout and then uh, bring in front of you from your voice uh, to your movements uh, and everything you were said. And um, Thinking about quantification and uh, thinking about uh, uh, yeah, like how the, the, this obsession. I'm just I wanted to share another um, uh, like a quote this time by Franz Fanon and in his very well known Black Skin White Masks, um, which is a, a, a quite influential uh, book. And he talks about the uh, the loss of his identity as a black uh, as a black person, uh, and how his identity is constructed by uh, the the white uh, the white man. And it, this is something that we keep kind of moving towards in term in terms of like these systems that we are adopting, and uh, without usually thinking like who they whose lives they affect, um, and. Uh, Facial recognition is uh, one uh, example of that, uh, of that datafication and quantification of, of, the, of, of the human. And uh, one thing that uh, makes me, um, kind of reminds me all the time is this, the past like um, a practice uh, of physiognomy that has been very active and throughout the ages. Uh, but also uh, has stayed so much alive that was that inspired and was kind of uh, adopted by criminologists and um, and forensics uh, people like Alphonse Bertillon, for example, but also uh, Cesare Lombroso uh, in Italy in the early 20th century, and and it's something that is coming back today through uh, facial recognition systems. And um, an art, Paolo Cirio, uh, an artist whose work um, 
very often uh, explores like critical ideas about these technologies and how uh, these affect us has uh, just very recently actually a couple of days ago uh, launched this initiative called ban facial recognition europe to enable citizens across europe to take part and also to to uh, engage in ideas around uh, and issues uh, about around facial recognition but also to enable them to lobby politicians to to ban facial recognition uh, eventually and um another another work that uh, we've been uh, involved uh, with and produced recently as well uh, and i wanted to bring up that also deals uh, with these ideas of uh, injustice and inequality is uh, helen knowles uh, trickle down and new vertical sovereignty and um, in, the, in this piece uh, helen knowles is also think, questioning whether technologies uh, could be used to um, uh, as, as tools to uh, for more egalitarian kind of societies and in these cases uh, exploring blockchain and this artwork which is a four screen um, uh, audio and a visual installation uh, which is comprised by this glass uh, sculpture uh, which includes this uh, coin machine it um, it only uh, it's only activated when the visitor drops a coin into the coin machine and then uh, this not only enables the installation to start, but also um, it means that it splits uh, into like micro uh, uh, payments, the, the money that has been received by the artwork to pay everyone who has been uh, behind the artwork from the, the art workers, the gallery workers, but also uh, the installation that is uh, made by auctions that were partly staged by the artist but also uh, create yeah and curated at like Sotheby's or um, the ethereal summit in New York uh, it means that everybody who's behind this is also getting uh, like a, a payment a micro payment um, and one of the uh, uh, people who staged the auction with with Helen was um, a group of prisoners at uh, in Liverpool and uh, this was also like part of the um, of the of, of the design of the piece, which involved uh, other people from uh, from the finance sector, but also galleries and um, and fintech as well. Thinking about how a system like that might um, work, but also at the same time um, bringing uh, the uh, the fact up that technologies, but also money, are not neutral in this case. And um, this. Um, one element of the work that I find really interesting is also, which was part of the auctions as well, is the element of the spectacle itself, and it was uh, also part of the of the blockchain enabled uh, um, um, auctions. But also, it's something that uh, I find uh, across in when we think about technology and these systems and automation as well. And this is a picture that I took at an at an airport uh, some time ago. Uh, which made me think immediately of uh, Astra Taylor and her work uh, and uh, her term Fox Tomason, which is uh, a lot more appropriate to use rather than, than uh, automation. And the reason why I'm, I'm saying that, and it's uh, what uh, Astra is kind of uh, pointing us uh, to, is the, the hidden uh, labor force behind these machines. And, um, Behind these machines and KiwiBot, sorry for the for the for the interruption. And KiwiBot is just one example. This is a Colombian a startup and company that create uh, robots for delivery, food delivery robots. But actually, what uh, we don't see when we see the, the robot on the streets do this cute kind of machine to deliver the food, is the uh, Colombian students who are behind the scenes and partly um, uh, remotely um, kind of. Uh, yeah, and check the, the, the robot and how it moves around and they are paid $2 uh, per hour. And, uh, and, and, it's, uh, and it's, um, it's really interesting in Astra Taylor's work is, uh, is putting us like, it's putting questions like that, important questions about this hidden labor and many of course other uh, authors and scholars. And uh, it's this type of uh, Fox Tomason that makes me think of uh, less of uh, futuristic scenarios, but uh, more like these past uh, inventions. In this case, uh, this is the dump waiter at Monticello, which is the was the residence of Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the 
uh, of the United States, but also the person who invented the dump waiter, which is basically a part of a, a furniture that is a disguise is hidden uh, inside uh, behind a door or like in this case in the fireplace. And it's a space where the servants behind can, pl can place the, the dishes and they are being they can be invisible to the guests and the servants of course are um, are slaves black slaves and um, I just wanted to bring another another uh, art example this is by Caroline Sinders whose work was mentioned by Daphne earlier and uh, TRK or technically responsible knowledge is uh, is a toolkit that Caroline uh, created and uh, and an advocacy uh, initiative that um, See, uh, created with uh, in consultancy with uh, workers uh, behind these platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk or uh, Crowdflower, etc. Et and uh, this tool is um, not only revealing the um, uh, the unjust labor and the um, underpaid and how underpaid and underpriced uh, labor is in uh, data training tasks in particular, but also creates a tool that workers can use to. Um, to show how much the, uh, the living weights needs to be and aligned with, uh, with these tasks as well and, and the calculator. Um, and finally, just because uh, I don't want to keep you more and, uh, and also go over my 10 minutes, uh, what, what can, I, can, can we do as uh, art organizations or, um, uh, or like art collectives? It's, uh, this is a program that we started at Future Everything. Uh, actually, it's in collaboration with Midas, and we're curating it. And it's called uh, Future, uh, Innovate uh, uh, Manchester. And it's a series of events, but actually uh, action um, events. Uh, so conversations, but also uh, labs where we bring together people from um, the business sector, tech industry, academia, health sector, etc to create, to try and uh, understand uh, the challenges and the issues, but also to try and uh, create alternative um, ways of dealing with these issues. This was our uh, most recent event called uh, Data and Ethics, and the lab is about, is about to happen in, uh, in a couple of weeks. And more events will be following around sustainability and cities, but also health sector and, uh, and AI. And with this, I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, I hope I didn't go over my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Irini. That was absolutely perfect. Um, I'm going to let those participants uh, who are registered for the uh, online workshops go now. And those who uh, are not participating in the workshops can stay and participate in some Q&A with the panel. Um, if you are participating in the workshop, you should, you should be able to join that automatically in a breakout room. And don't forget to fill in uh, the evaluation form uh, that will be put in the chat uh, as well, please, before you go. We're very much very keen to find out how this has worked for you um, in order to be able to make changes for the future. So those workshops are a, labor a laboratory of care in the online world, making art with arti artificial intelligence and live coding and computational creativity. So thank you very much for participating with us. And thank you also uh, if you're one of our panelists or uh, keynote speakers, um, or facilitators and you now need to leave. Thank you very much for your contribution. So I'm now going to pass back to Atalim who is going to manage some question and answers. If you have questions, please put them in capital letters in the online chat box uh, and Atalim will then facilitate this uh, with the panel. Thank you, Atalim. No worries. Uh, yeah, as Anna said, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat box in capital so we convey them to the speakers. Uh, while you're doing so, maybe I can start asking questions to all panelists. Uh, I wonder, like, with the learnings all we had throughout the history about human-to-human -human interaction and communication, we are creating new artifacts to interact with the machines, and those artifacts are generating a new version of a humankind in, a, humankind in every iteration. Uh, I wonder what we could learn from human to machine interaction and add them to human to human interaction. What are the things that you think we could convey from machine to human interaction, human to human interaction? I would like to open this space for speakers to talk a little bit about this. If there is anyone to jump in.
Okay. Tony? Maybe I'll start then. Um, right. Something that I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out that question really through my curating practice and just sort of try to ask what kind of new ethics and values come out of this. I was, I loved uh, Daphne's comment about how actually it's about the world we create around these technologies, about which ways that we care for each other. And I think that's a really great way to think about it. It's about how we, you know, interact with other people and what new ethics and values might happen. And I think machines take away some of that labor and allow us to maybe take up different positions of how we should care for others. Amazing, thank you, Dani. Any other ideas from other speakers? Can I join in? Sure. Yeah, I would just like to, to say that maybe a classic uh, worrying example of um, that can, let's say, exemplify in a way what you ask um, is in the case of, uh, let's say, virtual assistants, the role of the voice and how users interact. So I kind of briefly mentioned it. Um, what is, for instance, uh, playing a, a great role is the, the role of commands, the imperatives. So all these imperatives that are being used to talk to a system like Alexa um, unavoidably uh, influence, in a way, behaviors or may, might influence behaviors within, uh, let's say, a family or within a community of people somehow. I think, especially in the case of, um, let's say, the young users of these machines. Um, so this is something that somehow I kind of think of often. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a question of how, how to respond to that and what one, one could think about that, like what would the alternative be there? Because we see the voice playing more and more of an important role in our interactions and affecting us. So it's more of a common question. I don't really have an answer. Thank you, Daphne. Anyone would like to zoom in? Irini? Yeah, I just, I just, I don't want to repeat what uh, Danny and Daphne already uh, mentioned, but uh, yeah, just to um, reiterate and then just uh, maybe add that uh, all these uh, kind of agents that we, technological agents that we've been adding, like uh, they, we've been adding like a, an, a, um, an additional layer of complexity in terms of uh, objects that we, we kind of, or uh, yeah, people that we interact with. And it's, uh, and it's, it's really interesting in particular to see like the younger generations and uh, kids how they, who are um, growing up with, being surrounded by agents like that and how um, different um, how yeah how different behaviors are, are as Daphne was saying are kind of arising from these and we definitely and I, do, I don't uh, have an, an, an answer or like something specific but it's just more to say that we definitely need to start thinking about different frameworks and uh, from legal frameworks, frameworks, but also ethical frameworks in terms of how we, how we move forward and deal with these uh, more complex relationships in society. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rini. Uh, so from the audience, do you have any questions? to address to the speakers. Otherwise, uh, we will move on. And I'm gonna hand over to Hannah. Thank you very much, Atalim. And thank you all of you uh, for, for such an interesting dis discussion. So this brings us to the very end uh, of this part of the conference. I'd like to thank again uh, our keynote speakers. Uh, you can check their uh, presentation on YouTube. In fact, the whole of this conference will uh, be sent to you directly in an email link uh, later so that you can catch up on bits that you've missed. 
I'd like to also thank uh, the British Council, Atolla, um, BIOS and Nova Iskra for organising this uh, as part of the Connect Creativity uh, pro project. Please check out their website if you haven't already done so. And um, do fill in the evaluation form that has been posted in the chat. Thank you all very much for your contributions. I do hope that you all continue these conversations for many, many months and years ahead. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next event. Thank you very much, all of you. Bye bye. Thank you.